Hello. Good afternoon and welcome to New America. My name is Andres Martinez. I am the editorial director of Future Tense. Future Tense is a collaboration between uh, New America, where, we're, where you're seated today, an independent think tank here in DC, as well as Arizona State University and Slate Magazine. We, our tagline on, on Slate's website where we publish content, including a number of pieces by today's authors, is a citizen's guide to the future. Future Tense looks at emerging technologies and its implications for society and for our policymaking world here in Washington. In addition to uh, publishing uh, daily blog posts and longer articles, we also have, a, every month we take one topic and do a deep dive and we call those units futurography. And this month is, is on the, the space, the new space race. Um, and that is the, the unit that has inspired this event today. So I urge all of you to check us out on Slate's website. Uh, and if you're following today's conversation um, on Twitter, please use the hashtag FT Space Race. And you can follow Future Tense generally at Future Tense now. So as I was flying yesterday uh, to come to this event, um, I was in Mexico earlier in the week and I was flying here on a very packed flight. And I was thinking um, <laughs> this friction that we have between the, the idea of collaboration and competition is a very uh, fruitful, rich one um, on so many different fronts. And I think it's one that's uh, very much in evidence um, on our exploration efforts and, it, and what does feel like a new race to space. And we wanted to take this subject um, and look at it in the context of companies competing with each other, collaborating with each other, competing with governments, collaborating with governments, and also, you know, in a geostrategic sense, the traditional contest between nation states and also collaboration between nat nation states, which is so important. And what that motivates um, us to do together and also in competition with each other and why we do it. Are we exploring space because of what's out there? Um, or is it also, or perhaps even more so, about what it means for us here and what it does for our imagination? And I was thinking of it particularly in the context of my packed flight yesterday because um, I hope that uh, when we do take commercial space liners, we will have done away with middle seats. Um, <laughs> That's one of the innovations that needs to occur. And, and, the, and, and talk about collaboration and competition, you know, for that armrest, that's a whole juxtaposition of the two. So I'm thrilled that all of you could come. Uh, ha housekeeping matter, please. Uh, it's my role to remind you to turn off your phones. Um, and also, it, in the Q&A periods, uh, please wait for a microphone, which will be, um, in the room and identify yourself as this, this is being webcast. Um, also, what just another matter in terms of our show flow here today, George Whitesides of Virgin Galactic had a, uh, a meeting um, that was rescheduled that didn't permit him to be here at noon. So we have shifted that conversation to one o'clock um, with Anne Marie Slaughter. And that's, th that's reflected in the agenda that was handed out today, but it was an adjustment that we made um, late yesterday. So now let us let me kick things off by asking one of my colleagues at ASU to please join us to get us started with a, with her presentation. Lindy Elkins Tanton is a director of the School of Earth and Space Exploration at ASU, and she will start us off. And then we'll we'll segue into a conversation uh, that'll be moderated by New America's own Constantine Kakeus, who is a senior fellow here at New America and the author of the pioneer detectives. But Lindy, we're gonna start off with you. Hello everyone. Uh, let's see, I'm expecting a presentation to appear magically. Is there something I'm supposed to do? Ha ha, oh my gosh, brilliant, okay. I'm with you. 
Uh, so uh, why would indeed why I show this beautiful fish from La Specola in Florence? I want to talk. I want to start out, and it's and it's it's nice actually to be shifted because it's a sort of an introductory <laughs> conversation. I want to start out by talking about why we explore. Uh, very often, it's assumed that exploration is is a search for science, and so and so I'd like to start to talk about Darwin. This is part of what I refer to as the Darwin pickled animal collection at the Museum of Natural History in London downstairs. Uh, of course, Darwin, for those of you who are students of exploration, know that, that the Beagle was not a scientific voyage. Darwin was, in fact, a mediocre <coughs> student, and he was hired on to be a gentleman companion for the captain, lest the captain be bored talking to all the people whose main job it was to survey South America for trade and commerce. And so, and so science, in general, is, is an add-on. Exploration is mainly about nation building, trade and commerce, traditionally in, in the past. And, and, so, and so what I really want to challenge us with today is, can we make a, a bit of a new model for exploration in the future, something that's more fitting for the future of humankind and for this collaborative, competitive melange that was introduced. So uh, this, of course, is, is Ernest Shackleton, the famous uh, endurance uh, trip that when I thought about being an explorer as a kid, and maybe some of you did too, I suppose if this were a class, I'd, I'd, I'd challenge you to raise your hand if you once wanted to be Ernest Shackleton. Uh, it, but I think that the really amazing lesson for exploration with, with, with the endurance is that they didn't do any of the things they set out to do. Not a single thing. They didn't even get step one done uh, toward their actual goal. And yet he's heralded as one of the greatest leaders ever in the history of exploration. It's so visionary and so inspiring and the person we should all hope to be. And, and so right away, don't we have a suspicion that exploration is really not about getting there. It's about how you are and who you become while you're doing it and what happens to the people who are with you. And I think that's a kind of a nice metaphor for space exploration. So having wanting to be Ernest Shackleton, this is me in a very wild part of Siberia. I led a, a, a five field expeditions in, in wild parts of Siberia and, and they were wonderful, but I was also not the first one ever to go there. And, and isn't there that special thing about being the first? You really want to be the first. Now we were there for science, but it also happened that it ended up being a, a diplomatic trip also in a way. We made a lot of nice international uh, collaborations, and this is something that, um, uh, now I'm going to forget his name. Uh, there was a 19th century Englishman who, who stated that, that uh, science was a wonderful way to keep countries connected even when their governments were at war. And I think that that is something that we need to also keep close to our hearts while we're thinking about space exploration. Uh, this is going to be the hot spot for international relations. If we can't get along together very well here on the Earth, imagine when we're on adjoining a, a, a uh, a, a non-standardized Mars bases, how well we're going to get along there. So, so I think that that could, be, uh, that could be a kind of, Joseph Banks, that's his name, that could be a kind of a model for us. And so um, that wish to be first, this is one of the famous medieval T maps, a map of the world shaped like a T. This is the first one that ever used the word Europe, 900 AD. And so uh, we're going to be making a new kind of map as we go to other bodies. And we'll be the first to make that map. And we'll be dividing it up by nationalities, potentially, or by commercial industries, or by special collaborative missions. And this is where, um, at ASU, we're getting very involved. And this, and this is, and this is my, uh, my new project that I want to introduce to you, because what we want to do is try to address some of these larger exploration space problems. I'm always asking people, especially students, because they, they tend to like to think about these things. What do you want to have achieved in your life in 20 years? You know, I ask them, what are the imperatives of our time? Don't do a bit of science that's an increment. Don't do a paper that's an increment. Decide what's really worthy of you. And especially in this room, I think a lot of us have set our goals very high. And, and in addition to our imperatives, what are the biggest questions facing humankind? Uh, and we have a lot of questions right now about our future. And I think that a lot of them are going to be answered in the context of space exploration in and around it, not just international relations, resources, technology, social behaviors, the fracturing of the human race. So we're asking questions. We started an initiative called the Interplanetary Initiative. And so we're doing not just science and engineering, but we're asking these other questions. What's going to happen to the humans back on Earth? How are we going to feel when the first baby is born on Mars? What's going to happen to us 
as a species when life is really confirmed to be off, off of the Earth? Is it going to be a fracturing event or a combining event? I think these are critical questions for the future of humankind, and they rest in the area of space exploration. So this interplanetary initiative, Advancing Society Through Exploration, we're going to produce a new paradigm for university public uh, um, cooperative, uh, cooperative projects around the future of humans in space. I hope to be working with many of you on this. But asking those bigger questions, not just how do we make a better capsule, but how do we keep humankind together while we do this. Um, ran a bunch of brainstorming sessions with students. This is unbelievably fabulous for inspiring students. The number one feeling they had when they talked about the things that we're talking about today is the feeling that they're making history. If you give them a goal and a vision and something that's bigger than themselves, then they move past beyond the, beyond the content-driven education of the 19th century industrial workforce, and they start imagining and creating a better future for us. Uh, we're starting with, uh, with the big win we just uh, got in January, that is the discovery mission to the metal world psyche. Um, and I'm the principal investigator for that mission. And we are teaming with Space Systems Laurel. It's their first deep space mission. And so I ask myself again while I'm running this mission, what is the purpose of exploration? This is very science driven, but I think the real purpose of it is inspiration. The real purpose is to make everybody take a bigger step than they might have already taken. Now, when we're talking to companies like Blue Origins and Virgin Galactic and, and SpaceX and the other pioneers, everyone there is taking a bigger step. And if you imagine if we could get everybody to take a bigger step, then we wouldn't be quite in the quandary that we're in right now. And space is unbelievably uh, inspiring for that purpose. And so back to the subject at hand. The 47 years ago, we went to the moon. And then no one went anywhere for a really long time. And yet our national identity rests upon that, that, that America was the, the, the country that, that put somebody there. And very soon, we're no longer going to be the only country that's done that. And there are going to be private entities that have done this as well. And so nationally, first we had a priority to go back to the moon. Then we had a priority to go to Mars. Then we had a priority to go back to the moon. In between, there were some space stations. And so to go back to the beginning of the first things that I said, once again, we're learning that it's not the destination that's necessarily the purpose of the journey. The journey itself is a lot of the purpose. But when we combine commerce, then the end product becomes part of it too. So there are two parts. There's the inspiring to take a bigger step. There's the pushing all of society to a bigger goal. And then there's the what do you find when you actually get there. And so even though I'm all in favor of the moon, and, and, and I urge you all, by the way, to have a favorite lunar crater, I suggest Orientale. It's a really good one. And, I've worked on Apollo samples. Um, you know, I really think that, that Mars is where we got to go. Because when you talk about vision and you talk about even resources, you've got to think big. And Mars is really the big destination. That's the next thing that's within our grasp as a species, and we got to do it. So this is the first picture that Viking took of the surface of Mars. And so finally, just one of our more recent Mars inhabitants. I think we do need to choose a place. I think that place has got to be Mars, and I think we need to do this under a new paradigm where we figure out how to cooperate better, and we use this to make, frankly, a better life here on Earth as we're going forward. We've got to be bold enough to have an optimistic vision of the future. It's so easy to have a post-apocalyptic view of the future, but it's up to us, especially the people in this room, to have a really optimistic view of the future with a big goal, and I think that goal should be Mars. Thank you. It's time for us to. Um, yeah, this is where I say Lindy needs no introduction, although Andres <laughs> uh, gave her one. So thank you very much uh, you. for that presentation, uh, which uh, was, I don't know, inspiring to me. Uh, I think if the other panelists will join us on stage as I uh, uh, sort of uh, introduce the, the panel. Uh, so Lindy, uh, I should mention it's not surprising given the content of her talk. Uh, among many other honors, has received the Lowell Thomas Prize from the Explorers Club, which has gone to Buzz Aldrin, Edmund Hillary, and Isaac Asimov, among many others. That's a, a club you would love to be a part of, and, and we're, we're thrilled to, to have her here. Uh, Ellen Stofan, uh, to my left, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, had until recently, I think, one of the most cinematic job titles in the country, of being chief scientist for NASA, um, and had spent uh, a lot of time at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory uh, in Pasadena, one of 
NASA's laboratories, uh, which is run by Caltech. Um, and I think uh, by my reading, if, if people weren't uh, fake news out there, but you spent a lot of your career on Venus, is my understanding, which studying Venus, studying <laughs> Venus, indeed, yes, um, which uh, would sort of degrees Fahrenheit. give, yeah, exactly, good cause to be optimistic about the climate on Mars by by way of contrast. Um, Eric Stalmer is the president of the uh, Commercial Space Flight Federation, a, uh, a trade group. Um, and my understanding is that you've, you've learned to deal with setbacks in transportations from a young age when you overturned a boat on the Hudson River, uh, um, yeah. quite a large one. I, I did. I, um, I ruined that boat. I, I ruined that boat. But, uh, but it was a setback, yeah, and I, I got over it. Yeah. And, uh, and, yeah. and uh, I already uh, dug that up, though. Gosh. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. and, uh, and Scott Pace is the director of the Space Policy Institute at George Washington University, uh, one of the sort of preeminent paces, uh, places for the study of, of space policy. And uh, we're, we're thrilled uh, to have you here, uh, someone whose work I've read for a long time. I remember reading a report that you had done about GPS many years ago um, about, uh, for, for RAND, um, which GPS, I think it's an interesting sort of place to, to start and quickly move on for, of maybe one of the ways in which space has so profoundly transformed life on Earth. Um, and I think our impulse towards exploration is always in, in concert with uh, the immediate applications, which you know, many, many of the members of, of uh, Eric's organization, I think, are also sort of looking at how dramatically Earth-facing applications will, will be changing with small satellites uh, and, and things like this. Um, so I think one place to start might be with the space race. And, and I'll, I'll pose the question openly and uh, if any of you would like to weigh in. But I remember reading uh, John Logsdon, one, one, of, one of Scott's colleagues, uh, who's written sort of very extensively on the ins and outs of what was going on in the Kennedy, Kennedy administration in the early 1960s. And one of the shocking things to me was that the, the space race, as, we, as it's remembered today, was not inevitable. There was a lot of very early on discussions of collaboration with uh, the Soviet Union, uh, even well before Apollo-Soyuz and, and things like that. Um, and yet, uh, it's clear that the decision to spend as much money on the Apollo program as was done was not driven by science, go, going exactly to the, point, to the point that Lindy was making. Um, and I guess one way to start might be by, by thinking about a counterfactual history where we worked with the Russians. Uh, would we still have gotten to the moon or would we have fizzled out? I mean, basically, it would have been a completely different world. Um, and you can make the argument that Apollo, in some ways, was kind of a bubble, a technological bubble. That is, it was an injection, an accelerant, um, that um, caused more technical work to happen faster and sooner than otherwise would have been the case. But you can make that argument about the entire Cold War, uh, which in turn led to Silicon Valley in part. Uh, and so there's a whole series of things that, that happened uh, that led to technical capabilities that then shaped the current world. So uh, whether or not a particular diplomatic outcome would have been differently, um, I don't think really would, would matter one way or the other, the larger context uh, was a large amount of government investment in technology uh, for geopolitical reasons. And if those geopolitical reasons you know, weren't there, uh, you can argue that uh, you know, World War II may not have even have occurred, depending on what happened. So you can go down a lot of other different paths uh, before, you, uh, before you get there. The question is, would other countries have developed their own space capabilities uh, lacking that initial impetus? You know, would Japan, would Europe, uh, Canada, other countries have developed their own separate sca space capabilities rather than having been a bipolar dominance in the early days. Right. right, and we're obviously in a completely different place right now where we have at least 14 space agencies from around the world working on the global exploration roadmap. You know, people have held up the International Space Station as something that should get the Nobel Peace Prize. You're going to hear later from Talal, the United Arab Emirates is sending a mission to Mars. You have new players. You have. Um, you know, a whole era of international cooperation, we're just in a very different place at the start of this journey to Mars. Um, since you mentioned the International Space Station, uh, that might be a sort of interesting sort of, as we tra try and transition from Apollo into the present day. Uh, I want to return to Lindy's distinction between science and exploration. 
Um, if you look at the scientific return of the ISS, uh, the received wisdom, as I understand it, is that you know, the bang for your buck is not very high. Um, I'd oh, be open to having you correct me on that <laughs> um, and, and sort of talk about you know, if there are scientific benefits that are not broadly appreciated, what those have been, uh, and also how, as somebody who is inside of NASA, you see this distinction between exploration and science that, that, that Lindy was sort of enunciating in her talk. You know, when you look at the International Space Station, you have to keep in mind it's been up there for 16 years, which is an amazing thing that kids who are 16 years old right now have never had a day of their lives when there weren't people living and working in space. And right there, that's, that's a fundamentally mind-blowing thing. The other thing I think you have to take into account that while they were constructing the ISS, there was not a huge investment going into research because they were putting all that money into constructing the ISS. So we're really only in the last four to five years really ramping up the science that we're able to do. And in fact, it's only been in the last two years that the crew is actually now oversubscribed, where we have more science, more research for them to do than they have hours in the day. And that's terrific. But, you know, I don't know, you tell me if it's pr profound or not. Do you know the genes turn on and off in response to the lack of gravity in plants, in humans, in model organisms? Um, we have fundamental new ways of looking at combustion. There's a whole phase of combustion uh, that's been discovered uh, on the ISS. Uh, we're about to send a cold atom lab up to the ISS uh, where we're going to form a Bose-Einstein condensate in space where they last much longer. I think it's an amazing research platform. I think we're just beginning to exploit it and exploit microgravity. We're just not there yet. I've got to add something to that which is critical to all of us, is this information about genes switching on and off. I'm not sure how widely appreciated that is, that in microgravity, your entire gut microbiome changes. And as we, this is new information since, since the ISS has existed, how important that is to our health in so many ways. So there are going to be really interesting space challenges as we spend more time in microgravity. I'd like to add just one thing on, on the, the, the benefits that we're, we're reaping from the ISS research. Uh, there is, all the experiments that are going on are fantastic, and when you really delve into them, what they're doing, it's, it's, it's amazing. And, and yeah, they're not producing these high, high dollar you know, uh, rates of return. But I think one thing you'll see, uh, and we can look back to when it first happened, uh, and I think it was about two years ago, is 3D printing on, on the International Space Station. And, and I say this for a few reasons, because it, it, was, it was done by a company of young entrepreneurs, and when I say young, you know, uh, folks that were in their, their 20s uh, from, I think, UCF or one of the Florida schools, and through um, uh, microgravity research, uh, they were able to, or suborbital research, they were able to test the printer, and when the astronauts on the, the space station needed a part, they were able to use this 3D printing uh, printer. And, and, and I say this because I believe that manufacturing in space is a huge stepping stone to all the endeavors that we're going to do in space down the line. Yeah. And, that, and that one, I think the first thing they did was a wrench. And to be able to do that in space, th there's your building block. There's what you can uh, th start doing. It. And I think the, the, the possibilities down the line are going to be endless. And I think that, that that's going to be a real turning point when we look back. I would say one of the things about space station, and Ellen's absolutely correct in her characterization of how much effort went into development before we could get to, to research, uh, is, the, is the educational aspect of it. I mean, space is one of the most multidisciplinary kinds of activities, particularly human spaceflight, that you can engage in. You have to master basically every discipline to be able to, to do this successfully. And so what you're doing by going into space is you're literally going into an alien environment and you're learning how to live and operate and work there. And you're learning things that by definition you would have not have learned if you stayed at home. And so how much uh, value do you place on that learning aspect of it? It's not simply, gee, I discovered something that then had an ROI and I got a benefit out of it and so forth. That's great. We, we want to do that and we're looking for those things. But it's also the fact that you're learning how to operate at a scale that's far beyond what you would do on Earth. Not only technologically with the 3D printing, but also with other countries. I would say one of the most valuable things that's come out of the space station uh, over the decades has been the thousands of relationships, uh, very, very deep and trusted relationships between ourselves, the Russians, the Europeans, the Canadians, the Japanese, where we have done something that's really hard and brought people together in a non-wartime kind of environment. And so it's not just that physical but, object I mean, that's up true. there. It's, it's, uh, it's particle accelerators as well, right? Like this is true at CERN, well, at Fermi Particle Lab. physicists don't get out that much. Um, <laughs> you know, I used to be a physics major. Yeah. Um, and, you know, uh, so, so the ones I'm, I hang out with. I, I'm sympathetic. <laughs> um, there's a nice ski chalet at CERN, but yes. 
Uh, no, the thing is, in all seriousness, what, what happens is, is, yes, other forms of large science, environmental research do that, particle research does that, but what, what happens with space is you cut across the commercial communities, you cut across political communities, you cut across dual use to communities, so space is more integrative and more multidisciplinary, I would put it up against almost any other field. Not to say those other fields aren't valuable for science, but that's what space exploration brings that's unique. And I think that that is actually a, a, a foundational idea for education, that we need to now educate people more in a more interdisciplinary, team-building kind of way to prepare for this kind of work. But I, I want to come back to this point, because I think this is a uh, sort of justification for the amount of money that gets spent on space that, that comes up frequently. Uh, and I don't disagree with it, right? I, I think this well, is true. Um, <laughs> however, I, I want to... You know, the kid who dreamt of being Ernest Shackleton presumably like didn't dream about sort of like improving multilateral institutions and you know, the quality of international cooperation. Um, and I wonder if there is there something lacking in the sort of motivation qua the thing itself when we come so quickly in this conversation to this sort of secondary sort of soft effects. I don't. I don't. I don't think so. I don't think there's the uh, lack of motivation. I think one of the things you're seeing as we go back to the, the earlier talk about the space race is there, there's a, a, a clear divide, uh, a timeline uh, of, of individuals out there, those that remember the Apollo era and then the post-Apollo era. And the, the post-Apollo era, and, and you know, drew the, the line at 71 or so, uh, never remembered that, didn't know that stuff, only knew it from the history books. And you're seeing a lot of these entrepreneurs that felt maybe cheated out of, of what, what the capabilities of space and what could be. And those are the dreamers. Those are the Shackletons. And I think that they are putting you know, um, their money towards their dreams. I, I, Bezos, uh, Jeff Bezos said just the other day, you, know, you don't get to pick your passions. But he, he, won, he won the lottery ticket with Amazon. And he's going to funnel that money into what his passions are. And that's expanding the, the, or the democratization of space and to see millions working in space. And, and I think when you. You know, I, I, I cringe a little from hearing it described as a soft effect, because if, if you look at the data in the post-Apollo era, the number of PhDs um, rapidly increased after Apollo. So there was a motivation to go into engineering, well, into it's medicine. Well, it's a causal link. It's a pretty clear, I, I think it is a causal link. And in fact, if you anecdotally ask anybody why they went into that, and, and you look at Apollo, and you look at this big peak that came after it, if you look at countries around the world, you know, we talk a lot in, in the U.S. about needing a strong STEM workforce. If you look across the world with the challenges we have because of climate change, every country on this planet needs a strong STEM workforce. And the space is motivating kids to go into engineering, into math, who become computer programs, who become civil, civil, civil engineers, go into things that have nothing to do with space. I think it's huge for countries. It's the motivation that causes a kid to go into a profession that benefits a country. But I think you need to make a distinction between reasons of state and reasons of individual motivations. I said merely because someone is personally inspired or feels emotionally strongly about something does not create a claim on the taxpayer dollar. So that individual motivation may be why someone goes into it to, to make a difference to have an impact on the world, sense of personal adventure. Those are very important, real and personal motivations as to why people go there. But when governments ask, why should we you know, spend something on this? Now, if there's a military reason or there's commercial reasons, that's a different issue. But exploration that's not tied to you know, a specific rate of return has to be driven by larger geopolitical concerns. And so what are the reasons of state why, someone, why we would do this? And you look at human exploration particularly, uh, with, the, with two exceptions, they've always been driven by geopolitical. Of course, the Apollo moon race, Apollo Soyuz, detente after the 72 summit meeting, uh, the space station to bring together members of the Western Alliance and the emerging programs of Europe and Japan, the decision in the Clinton administration to bring the Russians into the space station to symbolize a post-Soviet relationship with them. The only two cases of major human spaceflight that occurred where international and geopolitical concerns were not a major consideration was Nixon's decision in 1972, uh, where international played a very minor role. Flying foreign astronauts was about it. Uh, it's stark contrast to Kennedy. And the other, I would argue, was in the Obama administration in 2010 with the, with the Mars and the asteroid decision, which was done without a lot of international attention. And as a result, I would argue, and I've argued elsewhere, 
was problematic because it didn't provide opportunities for people to partner as closely as, as they would have liked and would have been in our interest to do so. So in general, though geopolitical issues tend to be one of the dominant drivers, and then individuals participate uh, as, they're, as they're motivated. I think that there are, there are these very strong geopolitical drivers, and I think there are these individual drivers, and we need to use the inspirational aspect of space for that STEM workforce. But I would argue on a more uh, you know, brain STEM kind of level, as a species, we are apex predators, and, and, and exploration is an imperative to us. I don't think we can help it. I think in a way we're explaining backwards. On this geopolitical question, and you've seen some of this uh, you know, from the inside, and maybe you could speak to it. Um, the relationship of the United States with Russia is, you know, to say the least, strange in the present moment. Um, and uh, we have this cooperation around the ISS and around space more generally. And the sort of claim that I've been hearing from the group is that this cooperation leads to a, you know, a broadly better relationship. Um, it seems that maybe the relationship is very strange and there's this like weird thing going on in Baikonur where like some Americans go and hang out there and what is the broader effect? So I'm curious, like, can, can you sort of enunciate particular examples that, of things that have come out of uh, our cooperation over the ISS that have benefited the relationship more broadly? Well, you know, let's, let's go back in time. You know, and I have a very particular point of view on this, I did my PhD thesis on Soviet data of Venus at a time when the US and the Soviet Union were actually not, not really getting, getting along at all. To, to date myself, it was about 1984. Um, and I think the fact that we could keep lines of communication open through science, through NASA uh, communicating with Iki and through this ongoing relationship that we were able to keep lines of communication open where others had failed. I would argue space really literally is the higher ground where you can always keep in mind, can I have a concrete example of, oh, because we're talking in space, it made this other situation better? No, but I think there's this general idea of we can find common ground, we can find ways to work together, there's going to be a, a solution coming through this. And I would contrast that right now with the situation with China, where NASA is actually um, prohibited by U.S. law from bilateral uh, uh, cooperation with NASA, with NASA uh, which I personally don't think is a good thing. Because again, if you can find some and that degree, was quite a sudden change, right? Um, it's been that way for right, a bit, but yeah, passed. no, yeah, but yeah, when back, it happened, yeah, yeah. Five, six and years ago. you know, to me. And you have a situation now where the rest of the space agencies of the world are cooperating with China. NASA's not. I don't think it's a great situation. I think space, I think science is a way to keep those lines of communication open. I think the problem for a lot of space enthusiasts is they often think they're more important than they are. That, that they think that... <laughs> the shame Mr. Whitesides is not here. You know, we'll, uh, get his thoughts. well, the, the idea that if we have this great space thing happen, that suddenly our our, our consciousness is going to be transformed, you know, differently. What happens in space cooperation is it tends to follow political and political decisions and, and environmental decisions rather than leading it. So because we decide to have detente, uh, we do Apollo Soyuz. Because we decide to have a post-Soviet relationship, we do it. I would argue that Putin today is probably one of the worst threats to the Russian space program that the country has. Uh, our Russian colleagues are great. We love working with them. We trust them. We understand what they're capable of doing. We have immense respect for their scientific and technical capability. And we see their program suffering. Uh, we see it being harmed a as a result of the decisions that Putin has made. But because space is special in some ways, we're able to maintain those communication lines open when everything else is maybe not working. Uh, it's still possible to have that connectivity. It's not invulnerable. It, it is possible for that relationship in space to end. Um, and, uh, and it probably will uh, on the current trajectory. But it's probably the last thing to go, and I think we should probably try to hold on to it as long as we can. Um, I want to anchor us a bit um, in, the, in, the, in the present moment with, uh, and then open, open it up to questions. Um, the NASA authorization bill uh, passed the House yesterday, uh, and I think the expectation, and it previously passed the Senate, is that it will be signed into law, and this is the first such bill in, in seven years. Uh, so I wonder, sort of look, you're all people who follow this, this quite closely. Um, are you happy with uh, the sort of immediate future of uh, the, the US space program? 
Well, me personally, I don't equate the U.S. space program to just a NAT, what, what NASA is right. doing. Uh, I, I think there's there's elements in that authorization bill that are that are good. Um, there, some people rally around uh, certain objects of it. I, I think the real test will be, you know, when the the OMB numbers come out and, and when Congress has to hash that out. Because I think could you elaborate on that for uh, the people? Who I aren't? think they're talking about nineteen the budget of nineteen five nineteen point five billion. I think it'll probably be less. Uh, and when it's and then how do, how do you divide up that pie and where is that money going? I, I worry about programs, uh, you know, the space technology, the space technology mission director. I think they do fantastic things and areas. Can you elaborate a bit on what the things they do? Just oh, for, for the room? Um, lunar catalyst. You know, uh, different um, different areas where they engage more the, the commercial sector in these public private partnerships. And and one of the things. That, that we're, we're very enthusiastic about in, in this authorization bill is the, the continued use of these um, Space Act agreements. We think Space Act agreements, uh, um, funded Space Act and non-funded Space Act agreements, are a very good way to, um, for the, the, the private sector to do business with NASA. How it's do those work for people who might not? Uh, it, it's just a streamline. It's, it's much more streamlined effect. Usually, a, a lot of times, it's fixed price contracting. Um, but it's not this, this Never huge. say we're not wonky. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's not this huge, you know, drawn out um, uh, procurement system. Uh, it's a little more streamlined. And it's, it's, it's an easier fit for the uh, more uh, commercially responsive uh, companies. So we, we think that's a good thing. But I mean, there's, there's a lot in the bill for everyone. And whether you're an aeronautics person or, you know, a, an exploration person. Um, but it, we've, we just want to see how that pie is going to be di uh, divided up. Yeah, I mean, you always wait for the actual numbers to come out. And, um, you know, my concern, y you know, at this point, frankly, is the Earth observation budget uh, and climate change research. So if, if there's any part of the budget that I'm going to be watching what the numbers come out, it's that part. I agree. We, we're doing a lot to really partner with the commercial sector, I think, in new ways, in really positive ways um, that I hope are going to continue. And, and so I, I think, you know, watch those numbers and see where they go, because that'll give a hint of, of what the administration is actually thinking. Well, to be kind of wonky uh, about it, uh, the, the issue to watch, uh, if somebody wants to take a note, the 302B allocation, um, what comes out of the budget uh, reconciliation, what budget agreement. We are uh, on Twitter, as Andres okay, mentioned. Okay, so, so 302B allocation, which is the one that it covers both NASA and NOAA. Um, and so the, the pressure on all non-defense discretionary spending, which then flows into that allocation, which then flows into NASA and NOAA, is such that we can and should watch very closely on priorities you know, within that allocation. But the larger problem of, uh, of automatic uh, spending growth and entitlement spending in general uh, puts immense pressure on non-defense discretionary spending. And that is the thing which is grinding pretty much everything else in front of it. Uh, if we had the same budget for NASA today as we did at the end of the Cold War, roughly 1992, uh, the NASA budget today would not be $19 billion, it would be $24 billion in flat, constant dollar terms. And you can just imagine the breathing room that would give for a lot of things. But that's not the environment we're in, both due to political choices and structural choices that have been made in the budget. You know, I, think, I think it's also a really interesting point when you look at the increasing pressure because of entitlement spending, really nerdy stuff. But if you look at that going forward, for people who think, oh, NASA's going to get this huge budget increase if only XXX, it just can't happen. The non-discretionary federal budget has far too much pressure on it. And how, and then on this sort of question of sort of following the money, as it were, um, the new entrants, uh, large and small, uh, into uh, the space industry from, you know, SpaceX, uh, Virgin Galactic, um, who, you know, I think George is, I don't see him in the back, but if he's there, um, Blue Origin, many others that, that, that are, that are uh, I, I'm not going to mention all by name. Uh, there's an influx of, of new money that wasn't there before, and there's also a, you know, entering into the contracting process with NASA, the same as the Lockheed Martins of the, of the world ha have been doing for many years. Um, how much, I mean, th there's, there's an element of sort of a, a cultural injection of this sort of like Silicon Valley spirit, or of I've made my fortune and now this is my, you know, avocation, and there's also just more money coming in, and, and I'm wondering how, how you weigh, are, are those two factors of comparable importance? Is one more important than the other? Uh, I think it certainly helps and it benefits NASA to have this new infusion of money. Uh, a great example is uh, Bigelow. I see some representatives from Bigelow here. 
the, the, the module that they attach mm -hmm. to the International Space Station. Uh, just great you know, commercial technology that they said, hey, why don't we give this a try? Why don't we see if this works? And that's a building block for what we can do later, whether it's a cis lunar or, or even a, an, um, actually on a lunar surface, whatever it may be. There's that, there's the, the reducing the cost of access to launch you know, through the commercial crew program and, uh, and right now with the commercial cargo program where they're, they're bringing up resupplying the International Space Station. I, I think y with shrinking budgets, NASA has to look at these new entrants uh, and, and look at their track record. You know, in, in, in a short amount of time, in a very short amount of time, look what some of these companies have done. Uh, SpaceX and Blue Origin you know, come to mind, but look at uh, Planet, what they're doing for Earth observation. Uh, they weren't around five years ago. It, it's amazing. They, they have four, like 300 people working in San Francisco building satellites, and I think they're on their fifth generation of satellite. Uh, it's absolutely amazing, some of these things, and that's coming from a lot of that Silicon Valley money. Go ahead, please. Well, I would say you need to distinguish between different kinds of, of money. I mean, there's been an infusion of intellectual capital, which has been tremendous and, and beneficial, as, as, as Eric's describing. Uh, the problem is, is the, where is the new source of non-government demand? Because if we're simply spending government dollars right. in a more efficient and better way, that's good, okay, by itself. Okay, but fundamentally what you're doing is you're privatizing a government function. You're not really commercializing it. Right. The things where there's been really new demand that's come to the market uh, has, been, has benefited companies like Planet, Inspire, and Black Sky, and so forth, because location-based services, the Googles, the Facebooks, uh, driving geospatial and GPS industries uh, in the non-government side. And so I think it's really important that, we, that if you're specializing in this area, not to paint with a broad brush about what is right. commercial, because that term is very misleading. Absolutely. There's government contracting efficiencies, and there's things that are coming from a truly private sector market, and not all commercial things are the same, uh, because is private capital really at risk? Or is there private non-government demand for this? Does the market ultimately determine what the outcome is? If the answer to those is yes, then that's a commercial activity. If it's fundamentally dependent upon a government partnership in the longer term, uh, then no, right. even And I think we've seen efficient. that the answer is yes for non-human space flight, right? The things you mentioned. Uh, for information. And the size, right. right. And, and the size of that and nature of that market for things like space tourism is still a little... But that's the, that's right. the low-hanging fruit. You know, mm -hmm. let's go into low Earth orbit with robotic and, and get data that we right. need. But more things are going to be commercialized going forward. I, I'm personally very interested, oddly enough, in metal asteroids. Uh, it, but the, I think that the point about... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the point about um, the efficiencies and the innovation, that's going to drive forward the entire field when we're doing more than just privatizing the government activity. Um, uh, every NASA mission, every space mission before this has been a bespoke spacecraft crafted at great expense. And so as we learn how to reuse not just the rockets, but the plans, when we learn how to rebuild something and they become off-the-shelf items like these, uh, you know, virtually off-the-shelf items like the solar electropulsion, um, that's going to drive forward into commercialization of deep space as well. I think the space you really have to watch is low Earth orbit because we talked about the ISS a lot. NASA is putting a huge amount of their money into, into the ISS in low Earth orbit. At some point, we want to the NASA wants to take those assets and put them towards exploration, getting a habitat in orbit around the moon, getting humans to Mars. If the commercial sector doesn't, the private sector doesn't start seeing a motive for becoming the anchor tenant in low Earth orbit, and governments want to leave low Earth orbit, how is that going to work? And so I think over the next six years, that's really going to be the space to watch is what happens in low Earth orbit as governments start trying to pull out mm -hmm. and the private sector, does it come in behind them? Does it not? How does that work into the budget? It's going to be interesting. You learn to speak Chinese. So let's, uh, <laughs> let's take just a couple of questions uh, for, for, from the audience. Um, uh, raise your hands. As Andres mentioned, uh, please do identify yourselves and wait for the mic. Uh, I will add on that. Uh, please do make your question in the form of an elaborate monologue, and if you don't, I will interrupt you to <laughs> ask you to continue. Um, uh, yes. I'm Yasmin Nafasin. I'm a screenwriter, consultant, space ISU graduate. Um, I had a question about, um, you know, commercializing anything in space. You're, if it, it requires that, uh, I think that people who go, who are non-governmental or non-scientific, um, who are paying 
for their way. Um, maybe is it, is it important to have a purpose for, like, do you, how do I say it? It's like, kind of like an arc concept. Is it okay you, just to be a tourist? Is your question? Yeah, a tourist, but tourism, and, and that pays for something substantial. And then for other things, maybe they have uh, skill sets that are important. Yeah. One of the things I, I see about the space tourists, I, I, I don't want to say flippantly, but as, as I compare some of these folks, uh, about 300 or so uh, individuals that have signed up and are going to spend a lot of money doing this, they're paving the way for the rest of us to do this. These are the individuals that dropped down $15,000 for a plasma TV when it first came out. And so that we can reap the benefits of having you know, a $600 plasma screen TV and better technology just 10 years later. I think it's a lot of the same effect that it's going to reduce the cost for the, the general populace. And I, and I think uh, you know, whether it's for what they're doing, what, whatever reason and uh, motivation it is for them to go up, I think it's going to lead to a lot of motivation for others um, from, a, from a commerce perspective. Let's take another question. Um, if there is one, yes, um, uh, in the back, or unless Andres wants to exercise the. Uh... Yeah, John Wetmore. Uh, if the United States decides it's tired of the space station and leaves it, do the other international partners can they pick up the slack, or is the space station just, you know, salvage that gets re-entered into the atmosphere then? Um. We think right now the initial studies that were done is that the systems, we've, the space station, all the partners have agreed to go to 2024 at the moment. The initial analysis that NASA conducted is we think that the space station is good at least through 2028, but eventually the solar panels are going to lose function. They'll be, lar you know, it, it literally will not last forever and probably towards the end of the 2020s. And of course, because it's so big, it will have to be deorbited. Um, some of the partners, Russia has said, for instance, they might take some of their modules out and reuse them. That's, that's a possibility. Could you reuse some of the modules in other ways? But at some point, the space station as the entity, as in, in its current configuration, really can't go past the end of the late 2020s. I think something to stress, too, is given the long lead times that space projects take, if we're not planning right now for what comes after the space station, we are, in fact, default planning that it will be deorbited without any follow-on. So, you know, what happens right now in the FY18-19 budget really is going to set the stage because, um, you know, in aerospace, if you're not moving forward, you're basically planning to go out of business. I think we have time for one final question. All right, so... As please do just... identify yourself. I didn't prod... Uh... Uh, hi, uh, Paul, uh, International Space University student. Um, I just wanted to ask, uh, as you said, going forward, uh, do you have an idea of the destination? Leo, asteroids, the moon, and Mars, and why? Yes, yes, <laughs> all three. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I don't, I, I think, you know, we use a simple term that space is big, and there's a lot of commerce for everyone. And whether you want to do um, resource uh, mining, or if you want to do uh, moon bases, or if you want to do, you know, remote sensing, I think there's, there's a lot of applications there, I think, and there's plenty of destinations. Uh, uh, I think it's all moon. Let me, I'll, I'll rephrase the question briefly and then let you all answer. Um, if we take Mars, since you all, there seem to be a consensus that that's the, the destination, certainly, of, of the theme of the afternoon. Um, there's two challenges. One is getting to low Earth orbit more cheaply uh, than we have. And the other is sending human beings into deep space, into the radiation environment, into all the other challenges. Uh, and those are both hard problems. And Maybe just a, a quick closing remark on how you see, and, and they're not, they're interrelated, of course, but how you see that relationship changing in, in the environment of, you know, both the international environment, uh, you mentioned China, India has a nascent space program, and the changing sort of structure of American industry and government involvement in space, so. Well, I'm an optimist. I think in the 2020s, we're gonna see, we are gonna see the private sector take on low Earth orbit. I think we're going to see the private sector moving out towards asteroids. I think you're going to see the private sector in cooperation with governments going down to the surface of the moon. I think you're hopefully going to see the international space agencies keeping their focus on Mars. And again, to me, as, as Lindy said, this is a scientific imperative. We think life evolved on Mars. There's huge excitement. So I, I think that'll stay the focus. But I do think you're going to see it's not just one destination, it's multiple destinations. I 
I'll get early. So I'll just a quick from an economic perspective, the cost of launch will be, will reduce with more or with reusability, uh, which will increase the access to the opportunities that are affordable in space. Um, I would say that uh, destination is not a physical destination. Destinations are policy destinations: economic, security, diplomatic. We also get metaphysical besides uh, being wonky. Uh, so. uh, people who think solely in terms of physical destinations miss the motivations that actually drive governments to spend in this area. I agree with Ellen that Mars will be the, the penultimate goal and will be in the hearts of the scientific uh, community. Uh, I also believe that, uh, uh, quoting my friend Jeff Mamber of NanoRacks, uh, that Mars is in our hearts, the moon is in our business plans. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and that uh, the Mars provides more opportunities in the near term uh, for commercial and international partnerships that will in fact drive governments uh, even while the science community still has its heart set on Mars. Yeah, I think low Earth orbit and, uh, and then increasingly the moon, our, our, our local block you know, in, the, in the universal city, are, are really going to feel like an extension of the Earth's economy. That's going to be our estate. But then going to Mars is a much bigger push up. That's going to be a different group of people with a different motivation. And it captures the public's imagination. And we've seen that over the last few years. And we have to, we have to keep the public engaged. And Mars engages the public. Well, thank you all very much. Um, I think that's a, that's a good note to close on. And um, if, uh, if our goal is to keep the public engaged, I don't think we could do better than, uh, than George Whiteside. Who, uh, Thank you to the first panel, and thank you, Constantine. I was admiring your shoes throughout the, the discussion. Very cool. So now I'd like to invite um, on stage uh, George Whiteside, the CEO of Virgin Galactic, and Anne Marie Slaughter, the president of New America. Is Anne Marie here? Anne-Marie is on her way. So as all of you know, Anne-Marie is the reason we're all here. She's our fearless leader for Future Tense, being a collaboration between New America, Slate, and ASU. So Anne-Marie, please. Everybody's hurrying me. Now I see why. Sorry, yes. <laughs> nice to see you. <laughs> The conversation is how much for a round trip ticket to Mars. Um, I asked George to raffle off a free ticket to Mars today, so that's the good news. The bad news is he said it was going to be a one-way ticket, so. <laughs> so you might just want to settle for the tacos. I'll leave it up to you, Henry. All right. Uh, so welcome, everybody. Uh, and this is one I, I, I often explain to people that I spend my life trying to get street cred with an 18-year-old and a 20-year-old boys, my sons, right, who really don't understand what New America is and are not quite sure what mom does, and she writes, and so whenever, you know, I can tell them I'm doing something cool, my stock goes up. This was not a hard sell. When, when Andre said, you know, would you want to have this conversation, I'm like, absolutely. Uh, so I want I want to start with just the really practical for, for those of us who are not necessarily uh, space aficionados, although, you know, anything like Virgin Galactica, there's, there's nothing cooler than that. It sounds like a cross between a superhero movie and, and Star Wars. Uh, uh, what are we talking about when you talk about going to Mars? And I, I was saying earlier, so when I think of it, I think, I'm not sure how many light years that is, but I know a light year is really long and it's gonna be in a small contained space and I practically kill my husband on a regular basis in a large house and I pledge to spend my life with him. So wh what are we talking about? How many people in what kind of a space for how long? Well, it's, it's nice to see you as well. Um, <laughs> first of all, uh, many years ago I was in, uh, 
college, and I, I went to the Woodrow Wilson School back at um, uh, at Princeton, and and uh, Emory obviously did an incredible job there, and and uh, New America is lucky to have have you where you are. Um, so um, you know, I think um, I think that uh, I'm going. I'm I'm in town because there's a satellite conference. Uh, uh, going on, and it seems like every hour there's a new announcement coming out um, about uh, something, and and um, we we're in a, a tremendously exciting exciting time when uh, huge amounts of private capital are being deployed, and huge discoveries are being made. Um, I was just in a meeting with a senator that I won't name, but uh, we literally had a lot of trouble trying to not talk about this extrasolar planet discovery that uh, that was just made a few weeks ago. and But that's fantastic, right? Because there's really big things happening. And then, of course, we have um, one of the great challenges of our time in, uh, in climate change and uh, essentially learning how to become um, better managers of our, our home ecosphere, our planetary ecosphere. And so space matters not just for the business or commercial opportunities, but because uh, it's something that inspires us and also that um, we as humans have a lot of interest in, in because we're on a spaceship ourselves and we need to do a good job, a better job at, uh, at managing that spaceship. So that's a context. Um, I think um, you know what, what we're doing, what Richard Branson founded Virgin Galactic, um, and his aspiration is to open space up to the rest of us. And, um, uh, we have two business areas where one of them is to send people into space, and we're going to start with uh, suborbital uh, flights um, that are that are more regularly scheduled than have ever been uh, the case with uh, with um, with space flight before, and we can talk about that. And then we're also going to be performing uh, launches of small satellites into space, which is the area of the market that's growing the most. So, uh, and we we can talk about that. Um, so that's what that's what we're going to do, and we're going to start there, and then over time we're going to get bigger and do other things. But um, you know, we're really focused on, in a way, uh, this is a sort of a fraught phrase, but democratizing space. And all I mean that I mean in in the actual sense of demos, like opening space up to the to the people, uh, to people. So because because space has been, uh, or at least was for for many decades, sort of more the province of big corporate big big governments and big corporations, and 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 now it really is something where you know, a college classroom can build a satellite and launch that satellite and get good data back. And that's tremendously exciting. That means that, um, uh, you know, more benefits, the benefits of space can be shared more broadly on the planet. And it means that, um, you know, I think hopefully in 10 years, if we have a conversation like this, um, everybody in the room will know somebody who's been to space or and maybe, maybe uh, you know, a good chunk of the room but has actually been to space. But not to Mars. So I'm, I'm working my way around <laughs> to, to Mars. Um, <laughs> I, th I know that that's the, the subject of, of this. I mean, so I got into space because I was interested in, in Mars, um, in, in part. Um, and I, uh, I was a fresh-faced 22-year-old, uh, and I wrote, a, uh, uh, I, I wrote this thing, said, Gen X. Do you remember Gen X? Oh, yeah. yeah. I said, why Gen X should take on Mars as its, as, its, as its goal. And I think that's sort of what every new space generation does, is they think that now's the time to, to go to Mars. Um, I think that um, uh, Mars and, in general, solar system exploration will be enabled by, by one major thing, and that is lowering the cost of access to space. Right now, it costs about um, ten dollars to $20,000 per kilogram. So, um, so this is maybe a, p a pound, so that, that would cost ten to uh, ten ten thousand dollars to send that into into space. It's going to be hard to do anything ambitious if it costs that much. So we need to reduce that cost by a factor of ten, um, or maybe maybe more, to really enable large scale exploration of of the cosmos. And um, and what's exciting now, Amory, is that the competition that we've always hoped for uh, is starting to come down the line. So that you have. Um, you know, my boss, Richard Branson, but also Elon and, and uh, Jeff Bezos and, and other international players who are all going to be competing um, to uh, develop systems that lower the cost of, of space access. And, and that is going to be the thing that really enables our big space dreams to come true. But So I want to I wanna ask you lots of things about what you said. I want to ask about little satellites and suborbital sub 
orbit. Some or, <laughs> uh, but so, but what I'm what I'm hearing you say then is that kind of competition will lower prices. But won't we have to invent some like Harry Potter like time space? Uh, transformation to actually imagine getting to a place like Mars, and given just the distance? No, no. Um, we could do Mars. Um, we have an expert in Mars, like Tom Crum, uh, You know, you've, you've got some real Mars experts in the audience here, and and uh, I, I think you'd agree. Like, we have most of the technologies um, to go to Mars. It's just really expensive right now. But um, how long would it take? It would take about six months, I mean, depending on the transit time. So, you know, and, and that's with that's current... What's <laughs> <laughs> That's what current things. What what will be hard, and so and what we can get to towards the end of the conversation is going to the nearest star, and and that's going to be really exciting. Um, you know, Mars is <laughs> Mars exciting, is but but uh, <laughs> but you know we are the first generation that could probably send a probe to to uh, to Alpha Centauri or something, and. and Right now, that would take a really long time to get there. So that's the sort of you were talking about. You know, right. using, using chemical propulsion to go to Alpha Centauri, that would take thirty to seventy thousand years. Okay, all right. <laughs> that, but um, Mars six months. Mars six months. Yeah, and and you know, I mean, there's there's well known transfer orbits. Um, we've already we just uh, we you know I, um, uh, uh, Scott Kelly uh, just got back from from a, a year in space. So we we can do that. And right. and he 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 I mean he could still beat me up. Uh, when he got back, so you know, you, he's a strong. You know, as long as you exercise along the way, yeah. Yeah. You, you're going to be. Um, we can solve it. It's 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 a question of finance now. And but but the thing that I always used to say is, what do we want out of going to Mars? Like, I wanted to ask you that too. What what, what, is, what, what is the reason? What we're is your going? answer to that question? <clears throat> well, I'll tell you. I tell you what I, what I think would be an opportunity missed. And take this in the right way, because I got into space because of the Apollo program and all that. But I don't think we want another Apollo for Mars. And what I mean for that, what I, what I mean by that, is that we go and we do six trips and then we stop for four decades or five decades. I think that would be a shame. Why did that happen? Because it cost a ton of money to do each of the Apollo missions. Um, and so I think um, that's why reducing the cost to something that is is more doable is so important because if we go and you know and I'm in favor of going to the moon and going to Mars and and actually the asteroids too there are all kinds of interesting things out there but we have to bring that cost down so that we can sustainably explore um, explore the uh, the uh, the solar system so let's talk then about suborbital flight uh, and I was thinking so I was talking to my my mother this morning and it's my parents 60th, 60th wedding anniversary coming up and so they're going to go to Alaska. They've always wanted to go to Alaska. Many of us would like to go see Glacier Bay or whatever. And I, so I was thinking about that, and I'm thinking, hmm, well, you know, maybe by the time my husband and I get, maybe not to our 60th, but whatever, 30th or 40th, so we'll do a suborbital flight. What will that be, right? So when you say suborbital flight, I under, what I understand about that is I get, we get to a place where you can see Earth from a distance. And I want to talk about the, the what you call the overview effect. And my, But... Describe for me what, you know, is that just like flying to Australia, but, but from a different route, or is it, talk about it. Yeah, so, so, um, uh, so on our vehicle, uh, what, we have an air-launched vehicle, so technically that means that we carry our spaceship up to, like, I sort of aircraft altitude. The video is and very cool, if any of video, you uh, video go on the site cool. and see the video. And then we release the spaceship, and then uh, the rocket ignites, and it basically turns towards space, and it, and it goes up. And, uh, and the whole journey, you know, lasts a couple hours, order of magnitude. And, um, and you'll have a few days of training beforehand just to make sure that you feel uh, comfortable in the vehicle. And um, because it will be a high energy vehicle, uh, you know, you're, you're going to be going Mach 3, Mach 4 on the way up. And um, it will... Uh, Make that our 30th <coughs> wedding anniversary. Yeah. 25th. <laughs> yeah. But, um, you know, what's... what's uh, you know, you mentioned the overview effect, and, and I think, you know, everybody will go to space for a different reason. We have about 650 customers, and, and uh, they're terrific people. They're terrific people. And, um, and they know that they're early adopters in something that will matter to the future of humanity. And what's, what's inspiring to them is, is um, I would say that the number one thing that people want to see is they want to see planet Earth. Um, now, some people want to go because they want an extended microgravity, or some people want to go because it's like the next... Wait a minute, translate, <coughs> extended microgravity. They so like floating float. around they for float. a while. I'd love to yeah. do that. Yeah. Um, and uh, and 
Well, I mean, just a, a quick, a quick a discursion on microgravity, or uh, that's a technical term that I, I don't like, weightlessness. Weightlessness. Yeah, that's weightlessness. That's the part I, I got. The, the, scale the thing I love about weightlessness, so I don't know if there's a, there's a uh, parabolic flight. Uh, you, can, you can basically get in an aircraft and do parabolic flight, and it sort of simulates weightlessness for about 20 seconds or something like that. And I, I did that for the first time a while ago, and, and what was wonderful about that was that it, it sort of felt like um, a part of the brain had been turned on that had been turned off since maybe age one or two or three. You know, I, I sort of feel like we as mammals have a little part of our brain that sort of teaches us how to move around in, in an environment, right? And, you know, when, you, when you're a baby or you're a toddler or something, you're sort of learning to move around in a, in a 1G, what we call a 1G environment, right? And, and then you sort of learn, you learn how to do it, and then that part of your brain sort of turns off, and, you, don't, you know, you don't have to really know how to find a new, new environment, but then when you go into a, a weightless environment for the first time, it turns back on, and you sort of say, wow, this is a new, um, anyway, that's, sorry, that's a side, a side note, but it's really cool. It's really, it's definitely something to do. But anyway, um, going back to the, the experience of looking down at our planet, um, you know, they say that uh, the, the Apollo image of the whole Earth was the most powerful image for the environmental movement, and I, and I do believe that was true, because it, it, there's nothing that uh, makes you realize the sort of the fragility of, of, our, of, our, ecosphere, of our ecosphere th than that. And so I'm really inspired about sharing that with um, people from around the world because I, I think that um, we've talked to astronauts and they say that when you come back down, um, it changes you. It doesn't change everybody, but it changes many people in a fundamental way. And I think what our planet needs right now is people who can attack, you know, attack the challenges that we face with a planetary perspective. And, and there's nothing better than that than, than going to space to, to have that experience. So uh, we look forward to taking you up in a, right. in a bit, that, bit of time. I'm, 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 but that, that is fascinating. And actually, if you think about moments in history, what discovering the new world, obviously to European settlers it was to the new world, it wasn't to the people who lived here, but that fundamentally changed Europeans' ideas of what was possible, how to think about the world in ways that you're right, if you actually shifted to a planetary perspective. And I, I, I'm, you know, we're, we're all debating, or the debate in pub, uh, political debate is so much between nationalism and globalism, but I prefer transcending that and thinking about, you know, what, what it is on a planet. Uh, as, uh, you know, as an international lawyer, I, my career and so much of our career thinking about national politics is defined by borders and erasing those borders, visually erasing those borders. That, that, that is fascinating. Well, I w let me shift gears a little bit uh, to cultures. And you, you've been in NASA, and now you're in the private sector. And this is a, a we're going to be talking about collaboration co competition, part of the point of, of today. And I wanted to ask you to reflect on the difference between those two cultures because many of us might say oh well NASA that's a public agency that's all collaboration having been a dean in academia for a long time I'm well aware that you know academic scientists and your father is an academic scientist compete like crazy so that's crazy the idea that it's it, that you don't have competition in the public sector but the flip side is I would imagine with Virgin, Virgin Galactic or any well-run company you need a lot of collaboration. So how do you see the differences in those cultures and maybe particularly on the collaboration competition axis? I, I'm a, yeah, I mean, you know, it, obviously it's not either or. Let me, let me expose a few interesting or things that, are, that I'm interested in. I, I do think that humans um, perform um, well in competition. It, it drives creativity and it drives, um, uh, it drives uh, us to be better than we, think we might be able to be. And already you see the dynamic um, in, in the space world of competition playing out in launch vehicles. And you know we have this um, interesting sort of going back and forth between uh, Elon and, and uh, Jeff Bezos. And, and that's, that's fascinating. I think that's going to be a, a terrific dynamic. And, and, um, and because it will make everybody better and it will generate better vehicles. And, and so I think that that's really exciting. Um, for really big goals, to turn back to our, our, uh, our sort of subject for this conversation, Mars, for really big goals, um, you have to have some measure of collaboration. And, and the idea that we can um, uh, tackle a big goal together uh, internationally 
um, is going to be crucial. One of the big success stories of, uh, of NASA, but also international cooperation, is the International Space Station, which is, you know, an incredible feat. Uh, it's a government program that has lasted for 30 years and uh, whatever it is, Tom. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's multinational, it's successful, you know, it, and, and it's based on trust and, and it's based on uh, common performance. And we're going to need something like that when we go to, uh, uh, to Mars. I think one of the big um, questions when we do that is do we go uh, with, the, with the Chinese or not? And um, uh, I don't know if this current um, you know, administration is going to tackle that question. But, but I do think that um, over time, those fundamental questions of... Uh, you know, you, we're collaborating with the Russians. We're collaborating with with the with the Europeans in space. Um, we're basically not co collaborating with the Chinese. And from a policy perspective, that's going to be at some point we're going to we're going to tackle that question. I don't know when that will be, but um, that will and be a big that question. Fear of sharing technology, mostly probably. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that that is certainly where it started. And uh, anyway, it's going to be an interesting one. You know, it's interesting to think about that that. International collaboration traditionally has been the result of a great crisis, right? I mean, the United Nations comes about because of World War, War II, the League of Nations because of World War I, and you do wonder if what we may need, a, you know, a climate crisis, we're in one now, but a more acute one, uh, to suddenly shift perspectives on the benefits of collaboration outweigh the costs. It's interesting to think about. Yeah, I mean, um, we don't have a choice. I mean, pretty, when it comes to the globe, we, we have a planetary f situation, and, and national approaches are important, but they, they, they won't solve the issue, obviously. So I'm guessing I have time for one more question. So I, I, uh, so this is, a, you were talking about competition and the value of, of competition, and, and I certainly agree uh, that competition is essential, but, but you know, there are gender differences. This is International Women's Day, and nobody thought that I was going to get up here without reminding you that it was International Women's Day, I hope. Uh, and uh, there was a recent piece in the Times of the FT, I can't remember, on women are deeply competitive. I think it may have been the Sunday Review, but often we compete more against ourselves. And as a deeply competitive woman, I will just say that uh, growing up, you, it was fine to compete against yourself. It was not fine to compete against somebody else and beat that person. Either another girl, even then, not so good, and God forbid you should beat a guy, right? I mean, I received the message loud and clear growing up that that was, you would never get a husband that way. And I got two. <laughs> uh, but, so I have to just ask you, um, and I don't want to put you on the spot, but when I looked at the videos, uh, and I looked at all the astronauts, you had this a great video, and people are all coming out, and they're little astronaut things, and it, they're all men. In that picture, I'm not going to, but in the picture, and you might want to change your picture, they're all men. Uh, and in the, uh, you know, the, and there's a picture of a crowd also waiting, you know, and it's not all men, but it's overwhelmingly men. And so I just wonder, you know, when I listen to you talk about Elon and Jeff Bezos and Richard Branson, and I think, yeah, this is a particular kind of intense competition. Uh, and it is one, you know, I used to teach civil procedure, and I would stand up and say, civil procedure is the etiquette of legalized battle, which means we took all those guys who used to, you know, fight each other and, on, and turned it into the legal equivalent of jousting. Uh, and so it's fine. You channel all that competition into a socially productive use. Not everybody would think law litigation is socially productive use, but by and large. And you, you could say this too, but do you think about how to diversify and maybe get other kinds of competition and other kinds of collaboration and just more generally the values of diversity? Uh, what I think a lot about is, um, and this is going to sound really far future, is... Um, uh, part of the reason why I'm interested in space is because I view it as a um, uh, a start of a really long journey. And um, so we happen to be alive at the moment when, at the rough moment, you know, within a few decades, where humankind gets the ability to travel into space and to start exploring other planets and eventually other solar systems. We happen to have been born at that one moment where we start going outwards. And why does that matter? Um, it matters because the values that we send 
will persist, and not just persist for decades or centuries, but for millennia. Um, and that, that's what I mean, this is a super far future. But I mean, we're, we're sort of the home planet, but we're going to be sending out uh, expeditions, and then we'll be sending out settlements, and then, and then, you know, and on and on and on. And the values that we send along with those expeditions are really important. And one of the reasons that I got into space was because I, w I think it represents in many ways uh, the best of humanity, whether it's competition or whether it's cooperation or, or different things. It can be both. And so I think the values that we send out um, in space, and I, and I really do believe that in, in a general sense, the values that we are sending into space are some of the best values of humanity, um, are, are crucial because once you've sent them out to Mars and then someday, and it's not going to be next year, but, you know, someday we're going to send things to the nearest star system, and then they're going to start sending it, you know, and this is going to be hundreds or thousands of years, but keep in mind, humans have been, ex homo sapiens have been exploring the planet for about 200,000 years. So, you know, um, we, through some stroke of luck or something, we happen to be alive at the moment before we sort of start expanding outward. And so the values that we bring with us are going to be hugely important. And I think uh, it's certainly important that those, um, that we bring along all the diversity of, of uh, um, that we don't just bring sort of male values or, 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 fema oh. or female values or whatever, um, but that we bring sort of the best of, of human values out with us. And, um, you know, we just, uh, uh, yeah, so that's what I would say. This has been the most hopeful conversation I've had in months. Uh, I think I have a, uh, a renewed sense of, of how we may be able to pull together, uh, let's start with as a nation and then as a world uh, and as a planet, uh, and, and thinking about, yes, the, the overview effect and the, the impact of what it is to see ourselves uh, from space, but also then to think about who are we and what do we want to send into space uh, is, a, is a wonderful framework. So thank you so much. I can't imagine a better way to start this conference. Thanks. Thanks, really thank you, Anne-Marie, and thank you, George. And to continue on the hopeful note, I, I'd now like to invite up to the stage um, our, our good friend Talal Al-Kaisi, who is the director of the U.S. UAE Space Affairs Office. He's a senior advisor also of commercial affairs and special projects um, here at the UAE Embassy. And he's going to give a presentation on why the UAE is bound for space. And also I should, I should mention proud, proudly that Lindy's school at ASU um, is a partner in the UAE project that we're gonna hear about. And from there, I will pass off to Baton after back to our, our moderator with the great shoes, uh, Constantine, to take us into the next conversation. Talal. Thank you. Great, well, thank you, Andres, and uh, thank you to the New America for inviting me uh, and everyone else who's organizing this event. It's a pleasure to be here. It's really an honor to be able to speak to you a little bit about our country and what we're doing in space and why space is important to, um, uh, to the UAE. And I think you're, you're gonna find that a lot of what I say um, in terms of the reasons for uh, why it's important to us are, are what was mentioned in both uh, George's discussion as well as the panel that preceded that. Um, so I'll, I, I've got a few slides that I'll show to draw up some context as well, but the UAE, um, for, for those of you who don't know, is, is, is a pretty small co country, compar comparable in a certain extent to the size of the state of Maine, with about nine million or so in population and about one million who are uh, UAE nationals or locals. So. Um, and we try to distinguish ourselves as much as possible from other countries in the region by punching above our weight in many of the things we do. And you've seen a lot of this in, in some of the iconic projects like the uh, tallest building in the world, the Burj, Burj Khalifa, the uh, Palm Islands, and um, the biggest mall in the world, or the ski slope in a mall. And th things, things that might seem like luxury projects or, or, or PR stunts, but really have a, 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 an underlying reason uh, uh, behind doing them, whether it be the tourism effect, the economic effect, or uh, what, that, what, what these types of things do to bring attention to, um, a positive attention to a part of the world that needs, needs a lot more of that these days especially. So, um, uh, the, you know, with, with, a, with a, such, a, such a small population, 
uh, we've had to lessen our dependence on hydrocarbons since the discovery of hydrocarbons back in the, uh, uh, in the, in the mid-century. And, um, and in, during the formation in 1971 of the UAE, uh, the wise leadership decided we need to employ a diversification strategy to uh, ensure that we are um, able to depend less on hydrocarbons and diversify our economy further and further away from that. And, and as part of that diversification strategy, we looked at what are the comparative and competitive advantages that the UAE has using oil as an enabler to ensure that we're able to get into other industries that, uh, that could provide that solution. And um, I'm happy to say that today, with that diversification pro program, we're, we now are um, involved in several different industries where we're able to become um, an exporter of uh, uh, both knowledge as well as uh, service, as well as goods uh, on, on many levels, and that our GDP is only 30% contributed to by oil and gas in, uh, in the UAE today. And in Dubai in particular, it's only uh, 1%. It's about 99% non-oil trade. So, you know, some of the different things that we've done, we, we are one of the largest purchasers or customers for Boeing and Airbus uh, through both Emirates, Etihad, and, and some of our low-cost carriers. So we thought, you know, maybe uh, being part of that supply chain makes a lot of sense. So we have a structural composite manufacturing facility in the UAE uh, that's um, uh, uh, manufacturing there and are a tier one supplier to the likes of Boeing and Airbus right now. Um, on the semiconductor front, we also have some major investments all, or, all around the world, including in upstate New York and Saratoga County, a $6.7 billion investment uh, building, se manufacturing semiconductors. Um, and then on the renewable energy space, so it's one thing to diversify your economy, but you're also going to want to diversify your energy basket or the, the, the um, uh, source of revenue that you had initially and the, the, the reasons for that source. So for basically, we needed to figure out a way to lessen our dependence on hydrocarbons uh, hydrocarbons because of the environmental impact that that has. So we have a huge investment in the renewable energy space as well as the nuclear energy space. So space, in, uh, uh, space was an inevitable eventuality in terms of a sector that we wanted to diversify into for a multitude of different reasons. But more so than the diversification aspect, it was about trying to um, uh, inspire the youth and encourage STEM education. And I'll talk a little bit more about that once I draw some context as to what we had in the space industry uh, in the UAE prior to the establishment of the space agency and then what we're looking to do going forward. So um, we've had about $5 billion or, or so worth of uh, assets in space since um, uh, the late 80s. You know, we had the company like Thuraya that's, uh, you know, very prevalent in, in this week's satellite conference here in DC. Um, they have uh, satellite telecommunications uh, equipment that they uh, sell globally to both governments, uh, military, and, uh, and commercial customers. There's also Yasat, um, who have uh, two satellites in orbit right now in, uh, uh, that are providing broadband and military, uh, broadband support services for military and commercial customers. Um, and are working on their third satellite right now here with UAE engineers at the uh, Orbital ATK facility in Sterling, Virginia. So that's another very um, uh, uh, exciting project that we're very, very proud of. And then there's um, a few other types of entities over there, including the Mohammed bin Rashid Space Center that are uh, focused on building satellites themselves. So we started with Dubai Sat 1, where the team from the Mohammed bin Rashid Space Center, or MBRSC, went to uh, Korea, worked with a partner over there and developed and manufactured this satellite, launched it, uh, mainly an Earth observation satellite, then went on to building Dubai Sat 2 with the same partner but in the UAE and are now working on um, Khalifa Sat with a UAE team in the UAE. So that general and uh, gradual uh, transfer of knowledge and technology and the development and uh, the um, investment in the human capital that we uh, decided to employ in both the Bysat 1 and the Bysat 2 came to fruition uh, when we had a UAE team working on uh, Khalifa Sat right now in the UAE and building that there. So that was something very, uh, that's something we're very, very proud of. And then in 2014, the UAE government decided we wanted to um, bring the uh, space sector collectively under one umbrella, one federal government umbrella to represent the interests uh, on a b multilateral level. And so uh, the UAE Space Agency was established and um, the idea was to help uh, put together international uh, agreements and uh, you know, shoot for bigger and better things in space. And uh, I'll get back to that aspect of inspiring the youth and the reasons 
uh, we think that this is one of the best and most important and effective mechanisms to do it. But the types of relationships we were able to build since the inception of the uh, uh, space agency have been um, multiple with many different countries, but here are some of the ones that we did with the with the U.S. Uh, established a space security dialogue. We have a framework agreement with NASA. Uh, we're working with many of the commercial space industries over here. You know, we mentioned University of Arizona, some of the institutions. Uh, University of Colorado in Boulder is another partner of ours in in one of our missions. So it's um, it's. A, a very um, uh, collaborative approach that the UAE wanted to employ in ensuring that we were uh, working with international partners to uh, attain the goals that we've uh, we've set. So then, simultaneous to the announcement of the um, space agency, uh, the the uh, leadership of the UAE and His Highness uh, Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, the Vice President. Uh, uh, Prime Minister and ruler of Dubai announced a mission to Mars. And this is back in 2014, and we, the, the objective was to have the mission reach the Martian orbit by 2021, which is our, 40, uh, our uh, 50th year anniversary. So uh, a very ambitious timeline, a very ambitious project, and obviously something we can't do on our own. And that's where the project management team that have worked on building satellites in the past came into play to where they were able to assume uh, uh, managerial roles and, and, um, and partner with international institutions to ensure that we were not only defining the science and figuring out collectively and collaboratively the, the questions we wanted to answer in terms of what we wanted that Mars mission to accomplish, but also building the spacecraft, integrating it, and, and uh, launching it, and uh, getting, to, uh, getting to Mars by the uh, uh, deadline that the government set. Um, there are many other uh, investments in space that we have. Uh, uh, George was here a few minutes earlier, and um, uh, Virgin Galactic are uh, a proud uh, partner of ours. We've uh, invested a certain amount of money uh, with, with them in their, pro in their program um, since uh, I think it was 2011 or 12. And uh, we're very, very happy with the collaboration we have with them uh, so far. Um, so back to the long-term objectives and the reasons why we're, we're going to space. Um, when you look at the region, you have about a third of the world's population in the Middle East and North Africa. And you have 50% under the age of 25, with um, um, unemployment rates that are staggering. And you see a lot of um, disenfranchised youth that are gravitating to some of the uh, um, uh, things that you, 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 you witness in the media which are not very productive and not very promising for our future. Space is one way that we think, the, as the UAE, we can inspire the youth not only in our country but across the region to look at other opportunities and other things where you could have um, uh, options if you, uh, if you, um, uh, you know, get an education within the STEM within STEM education, and you're able to uh, uh, employ that in your, in your work life. And we think that's a very, very important aspect to trying to help shift uh, uh, and win the hearts and minds of the youth in the region. And we're, hope we're hopeful that not only do um, students and kids and others in the region get inspired, but even governments in the region are inspired to be able to um, uh, emulate what the UAE is, be is doing in uh, diversifying the economy and going through ambitious projects like uh, uh, space exploration to inspire their youth and ensure that um, they make the, 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 the future for the world a much better place. So with that, I think, um, what I'd like to do is leave with a quote and then take a few questions since I think we have about five minutes left. But this is a quote by His Highness Sheikh Mohammed that says, this probe, the probe that we're sending to Mars, represents hope for millions of young Arabs looking for a better future. There is no future, no achievement, no life without hope. And thus the name of the spacecraft after um, crowdsourcing ideas on social media with the Arab world uh, was dubbed hope uh, in, uh, in honor of this. So um, happy to take a few questions. Um, either, yeah. Great. Oh, it's coming right there. So, in in what way do you prepare uh, to, to find? Oh, how do you find? Um, 
the most talented people among your population, the young people, and train them and identify who they are, even if they're, they're poor or they're richer, you know, it doesn't matter, but how do you find that? I, I spend a lot of time in, in this region. I know that there's a lot of talent. Um, and how do you train them to be the, 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 the best, the best, the young people? Yeah. yeah, so that's a very good question. So how do we train and, and how, do we, how do we find the, the right talent to integrate into these types of programs? So we, we be hopeful that they find us, that the people that are inspired come with their ambitions to, to uh, 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 be part of these types of programs. But then how do we equip, with, equip, with, equip with them with the uh, tools necessary to excel in these, in these roles? Um, that's where the international partnerships come in uh, in a big way. We have you know, several partnerships on the commercial side uh, with the big um, uh, manufacturers, both here in the US and elsewhere, as well as with the likes of NASA, where we have internship type programs and training workshops and, and things where we can have our uh, students and trainees embedded within organizations uh, to help them uh, attain that skill set. Um, We've done things with Orbital ATK, with Lockheed Martin, uh, and, with, and we're working on doing similar things with NASA as well and others in the international uh, uh, sphere to ensure that we're equipping our, uh, our students. Yeah. Sir, in the back. Yeah, 21, 2021 is going to come upon us really quick. You have a, your mission. Hopefully, it's a success. Uh, you put together this brilliant group of people, what do you do with them next? Do you have a, a follow-on? Uh... Yeah, so um, there's, there's our, there are many things that we're planning to do next. I mean, there was a recent announcement right after the government summit in Dubai about Mars 2117. Uh, and the plans for that are under development right now, but the idea is to try to work collectively again on, on the different things that would take to uh, uh, have a self-sustaining colony on Mars by 2117. And so the, the types of things that were discussed earlier today, I mean, post uh, com commercialization of post lower, uh, of low Earth orbit post ISS is an important element. You look at the transportation vehicles and lowering the cost of access to space. You look at um, asteroid mining and the types of things that, you know, in space uh, uh, um, uh, resource utilization. These types of things are all part of the um, uh, suite of options that the UAE uh, are, are, are looking at in terms of where to go next and how to carve out a niche for something that we would be able to participate in. Yeah. So still undefined, but we're, we're exploring. Sir? Uh, great presentation. I was wondering when you were conceiving the organizational structure, uh, were you looking at a particular space agency to see how it's going to be organized uh, uh, to execute the work? Yeah, so it's, uh, it's a good question. Look, so when we do, uh, in the UAE as a very young country, we have the luxury of starting from scratch on many of the programs that we embark on. And that's, that's, a, that's a great benefit. I mean, it, you're able to benchmark best practices all across the world and then learn from the mistakes of the best sometimes. And so, um, uh, Structurally, I think that was the easy part. I think defining and, and coming up with the national space policy and then ensuring that it would be, uh, to an extent, timeless, but also vague to the point where it could be inclusive of incentivization of the commercial industry uh, more so than a lot of other places would give us that differentiating factor. I think that's where having subject matter experts from all over the world, and uh, including the US, uh, we were able to come up with that type of a policy that's conducive to um, uh, uh, the, the uh, industry on all its facets, whether it's government or commercial. So, uh, yeah, I think that was the, that was the most, uh, 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 the biggest accomplishment, I think, in coming up with that policy. Um, so I think, see, time is, time is up. Well, thank you very yep. much. Great. Thank you. Really appreciate you taking the time. And, uh, I'd like to invite uh, up to the stage our, our next panelists, uh, Rob Chambers, uh, Tom Kremens, and uh, Veronique uh, Dockendorf. Um, I pronounced this correctly? Nope. Yeah. Uh, I probably did not speak quickly. The orbiting Mars stuff, was that you or the other way? Okay. Um, so, um, and I guess I will skip at the end here. Yes, sorry. Let me meet you in person. We um, the other day. Uh, Rob uh, is an engineer at a, please sit and, uh, Rob is an engineer at Lockheed Martin, who's done a great deal of work uh, on uh, Mars in general and the Orion uh, in particular. 
Uh, Tom Kremens is the Associate Administrator for Strategy and Plans uh, at NASA. And uh, Veronique Ockendorf from the Embassy of Luxembourg uh, is here, I think, particularly to talk about sort of asteroids and, and space mining uh, and, and, and uh, the sort of role that Luxembourg is envisioning for itself um, in that respect. Um, there are a few different ways we might start out. I thought one, one way to launch us into this discussion uh, is part of the way in which collaboration and competition is structured um, is through the nature of, of international agreements. Of, uh, you know, we've agreed uh, in the Outer Space Treaty uh, not to make property claims, uh, you know, national claims in space. Uh, there is you know, ongoing discussions about the peaceful uses of outer space and, and the nature of that competition. Uh, and, and Tom, I, I know that you, you spent some, quite a lot of time uh, in the negotiations around the ISS and have sort of a deep experience of uh, multilateral discussions of, of this kind. Um, it seems to me that part of the sort of gist of this discussion is that there will have to be a, a major revision to how we think about the commons in, in outer space. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are on what that will look like. Well, I think to start, it requires um, presence, because if you're not there, it's, it's an opinion. So it's actually uh, being in the commons, as it's kind of to George's point that you made earlier about the values you take with you. So I think first part is it's important to maintain U.S. leadership and presence in space to be able to help shape what the commons will look like. Um, for us, um, what we've been able to develop around the space station with 15 partners, national partners, and now a host of commercial entities that are joining and um, we're hoping ex explodes over the next decade and shifts from space station to a low Earth orbit in general. We view our job not so much as setting the policies, that's really for State Department and others, but for setting the example of how we work and operate so how we deal with other nations um, in terms of our code of conduct, in terms of how we operate our spacecraft, that we, how we actually, how we operate shows what we believe in. So we don't, we try to mitigate debris. We try to use all the fuel um, on our spacecraft and practice smart orbital practices for, uh, and share our information broadly with other nations for space situational awareness purposes. So, that's kind of what NASA's role is, is to kind of be out there doing it and doing it in a way that represents the kinds of values and the kinds of norms we'd like to see um, continue to develop and, and to diversify over time. Um, that's a sort of natural segue, speaking of space situational awareness, to the nature of the sort of military-civilian relationship in, in space in, in this country and, and in other countries. Um, Low Earth, if low Earth orbit is to get more and more crowded, whether we're on our way to Mars or just launching small satellites for Earth observation, this becomes a more and more pressing problem. Uh, and it's something that you know, the people at Shriver Air Force Base are pretty deeply interested in. Uh, and the relationship between NASA and you know, the Air Force and the American military as a whole is, is a deeply intertwined one. Um, and I guess to, to put this in the form of a question, how do you see that relationship evolving as the commercial space sector evolves. So, I'll, and then I, yeah, yeah, yeah okay. and then I want to I want to turn turn to okay. To so, Rob's so I, I I I think that uh, relationship's been there since the beginning of the space age. But what's become more complex now is the number of actors, the number of both commercial and national actors uh, in space. There's um, that's grown just in the last 10, 15 years you know, the slopes like this. So we're, we've got, um, just as NASA, we've got over 800 active agreements with over 120 nations. Um, so um, as well as uh, commercial agreements, uh, non-traditional kinds of agreements with folks like George and other, other companies, over 1,100 of those type of active agreements, which if I, and I did look at about a decade ago, it was roughly um, two-thirds less at that time. Um, so with that complexity comes the importance, again, of um, being able to work together and allowing competition, productive competition, um, as well as collaboration at a government level that in a way helps the people which, and the, on the DOD side um, to not have to deal with as acute 
a threat environment as might be there if we weren't engaged. So you mentioned my work with the Russians. Um, that was a key part of trying to shift from the late 80s where we had, um, and unfortunately we're kind of going back there in some areas with certain countries, but where space threats were a big part of, uh, of what we worried about. Um, cooperating with the Russians in part helped to get rid of their co-orbital ASAT and to change their behavior uh, in space. I think yeah, and satellite weapon, if you could just elaborate on what that is for people who um, might not know. But in that, that time frame, it was a direct ascent, something that got shot from the belly of a, of a Soviet fighter and could take out a satellite. Um, now the threat environment is Which is just so with the F-16 tests that back in the 80s we've done as well, exactly, right, a long time ago. Exactly, so um, with the cooperative activity in space um, and actually having people living and working and depending upon um, not getting blown up while they're working because it's hard enough to live and work in space, that has allowed to a certain extent a um, little bit of a firewall at least get people to think about that there's, it's not just a, um, another frontier for warfare. Although, again, we're, we're seeing that threat environment extend out now a little bit, so it's, it's going to be a key part of both in low-Earth orbit and now as more countries go out to around the moon, um, as, we, as humanity moves out, how we can um, use soft power and use the other tools of international game, engagement, diplomacy, economic interaction as other tools in the national tool chest to help with the other side of, of space, which, you know, which we butt up against, but we're very conscious of trying to maintain a, a very uh, white world, um, internationally engaged, commercially engaged um, image and reality. So, Rob, I, I want to sort of turn to you with a, a cartoonish vision of history, which I don't think is sounds, true. Sounds appropriate. Um, <laughs> um, I mean, there's, there's, there's a story that, you know, Apollo was, we were all very excited. Then, you know, eventually Jimmy Carter becomes president. There's a national malaise that extends into space up until, you know, Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk, like, make a ton of money and, like, make space exciting again. And meanwhile, you know, all the guys at Boeing and Lockheed were like, I don't know, just doing nothing for, for decades. <laughs> um, and I don't think that's true. Uh, and I kind of doubt Thank that you. you do. Thank you. Uh, yes, and I uh, what, what I want is, is as, as a sort of opening for you to maybe look back on, mm -hmm. on a long and, and accomplished career uh, at a place like Lockheed, where you have a tremendous amount of technical expertise, you know, at Lockheed and, and your peer competitors mm -hmm. uh, who've been doing good and difficult work for many decades in a way that that narrative certainly has not, is not part of your sort of person on the streets right. vision of what's happened. Right, yeah. uh, and I'm curious as to why and I'm curious as to what that looks uh, from, from your side of, and, and th these aren't sides in that people mm -hmm. clearly have gone to work for the new generation of companies from, from the old different ones. lenses, right? Yeah, Absolutely. These, so, so I was born after we landed on the moon um, and I've been pretty bitter about it ever since because I missed that. Um, so, and, and I agree with one thing in particular George said, which is it's Gen X's turn, I'm, I'm, I'm Gen X, uh, to, to, to hit Mars, right? That's, that's ours, it's not our kids. They can go to Europa or whatever the hell, but this one's, this one's our, our generations. So, um, so we've been on, on Mars for 41 years now, right, uh, Lockheed has been uh, uh, fortunate enough to be working closely with NASA on every Mars mission that ever went, worked on Viking, um, explored, I think, just about every planet in the system, plus whatever one calls Pluto these days. So is the we there Lockheed or humanity? Or? Uh, Lockheed, which, which is part of humanity. Right. Um, <laughs> and, and a publicly traded commercial company. Yeah. Um, so we've been doing that for a long time, and, and the focus, and, and you're right, it hasn't got a lot of attention. What, gets, uh, what people get really excited about, and why I went to Purdue and went straight into working for NASA and done civil service my whole life, uh, those programs, is to explore, right? It, it's the get the humans off the planet. Um, we were talking, I think it was Lindy that referred to the, the walking around the city block. Well, my company and, and the folks I work with on the NASA side, we're the guys that grab a backpack and get the heck out of the city, right? So that's, it's a different, it's very different. Um, for the last, say, 40 or more years, our focus has been working with NASA to go to Mars, explore um, Venus, you know, latest missions out into Jupiter and beyond. Juno just, uh, we, we got into Juno insertion last July. Uh, Insight's coming up. And that has, has. Insight, 
Uh, InSight, uh, next uh, spacecraft going to Mars, launching in 20, next year, May, March, I think. Yeah. I'd venture that a decent chunk of the room knows that, but not all of it. Yeah. And then, right, and then there'll be Nemo and the next uh, uh, lander and so forth. So, so there's this, been this cadence of every two years uh, going to Mars, if we focus on Mars for just a second, with a steady aggregation of data. And, and there was a little bit of a lull there when we thought Mars was dead. Um, like the moon, and, and in fact, that there's, it's very static. And if you're looking at a rock in a lab, it doesn't, you don't have to be really interact with the rock. You can go home, and if it is a rock, when it comes back, the rock is still there, unless it's a diamond and it's been stolen. But if it's just a cheap rock that no one's going to take from your lab, it's still there the next day. Mars is not a rock. It is alive. There's running water. There's methane sources we don't know. And so when I, I don't quote Blocky just said there's life on Mars. I said it's <laughs> alive in that it's changing. We're on Twitter, everybody. Evolution. Oh, God. My phone's going to ring. Yeah. Um, communications, guys. So the, um, it's evolved. It changes. And so you have to change dynamically with it. Well, we didn't realize that. So there was a lull there where we didn't do a lot of Mars exploration. We thought it was dead. And then we started learning how much is going on. And so that has started to percolate out into the sort of the, 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 um, the social world, right, In, into the, the public perception. And that's part of the reason, frankly, why everybody wants to go to Mars. Um, and it, when I say everybody, the scientists and NASA and the space agencies, and that has gotten out into the public conscience. So um, I think it's great that now we're getting a lot of folks interested in, in LEO and the, and the applications and true commercialization. I like what Scott said to differentiate commercialization from privatization. I think we get very confused about that. Um, that's all very good to get an infrastructure, but then you need the crazy guys with a backpack that are going to Mars. And, and so that's, you know, Orion and SLS, and maybe we'll talk a little bit about that in, in a conversation here, is how close we are to, to achieving that. So, uh, Veronica, I, I want to turn to you and then queuing off of something that, that Tom mentioned of, you know, once you're there, once you're in the commons, then you start having a different sort of discussion than, than if we're talking about something in the abstract. If uh, we can all agree to sort of share, you know, Alpha Centauri equitably because like none of us is going to be there anytime soon. Um, <laughs> things start changing if you go out and start taking stuff. Um, and uh, not necessarily in a bad way, right? It's uh, the, the, the sort of like economic incentives are, are powerful imperatives. Uh, and, you know, Luxembourg has been you know, in the past year or so, I think, uh, making a concerted effort to be out in the front of that. And I, I'm curious just to hear you talk a little bit about uh, what it is that, uh, as a sort of nation, uh, Luxembourg ho hopes to accomplish both for itself and, you know, as part of a sort of like broader effort in space. Yes, uh, absolutely. About a year ago or so, February last year, I think our Minister of the Economy announced that um, Luxembourg would go into asteroid mining. And that created a big fuss in little Luxembourg. And is he gone crazy now? And what's going on? <laughs> um, and 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 in fact, it, uh, it it's a little bit like uh, Talal was describing. Um, it, it's not something that just uh, fell from the sky upon Luxembourg like that. It's something that has been worked on for a while. But the the basic um, if the asteroid premise, fell from the sky, uh, yeah, then you wouldn't, that, you know. <laughs> would be easier. Um, we we are looking into economic diversification in the first place. Of course, we are a, uh, a country that uh, came from steel, went to banking, then satellites. We, um, we have a bit of experience, we think, in space because we have the biggest satellite company of the world um, headquarters in, in Luxembourg. And at a time when we founded that company, people also thought we were crazy. So um, the minister felt and the government felt that this was um, something that Luxembourg could possibly play a useful role in, in terms of um, the commons and international uh, collaboration, and at the same time diversify our economy and, uh, and hopefully create a hub in Europe um, for space exploration. Um, and to make that possible, we've drafted a law uh, based on the Outer Space Treaty, and it's basically to implement um, those bits of the treaty that say that if you want to go uh, into space and um, explore and use the resources that you find there without appropriating the, the bodies themselves, the asteroids themselves and so on, you need uh, authorization from a state party to the Outer Space Treaty. And so that's what we're doing. We, we drafted a law, it's in Parliament right now. Uh, we hope to have it adopted in the course of this year. And from then on, the US, I think, has a very similar law um, enacted about two years ago. Um, and then from that moment on, we're hoping that um, companies will 
uh, will use this Luxembourg law to get licenses to uh, to explore and use what they what they find. Um, and we are at the same time um, investing into research and development activities and partnering with a number of all those commercial companies that are uh, in space um, to to help them uh, achieve what they want to do and, and hoping that we we can uh, attract business to Luxembourg while at the same time um, working in a very exciting field and we are um, we're also working in the international uh, fora that deal with space on, on these matters we the difference with the Emirates for example might be that we don't have a national space agency and deliberately so we are a much smaller country than the Emirates we're the size of Rhode Island we have uh, 600,000 people, not 9 million, and so on. So we're in, a, um, we're in the middle of Europe between other big states. Um, so we deliberately decided to do this through ESA, the European Space Agency. We became a member in 2005. Uh, we chaired it with Switzerland uh, over the past few years to also show that this is not only about um, the Luxembourg economy and about doing business and, and earning money. This is also about pushing a field, uh, and we think Luxembourg has well, is well placed for this. We're small. We've been uh, in in the European Union from the beginning. We know what it takes to you know sit between the big ones, um, mediate, uh, try and find agreement, <coughs> negotiate, and so on. And so we thought, well, maybe this is after the satellites. Maybe this is a new field that we go, could go into. So mentioning the European Space Agency, uh, I want to get Tom's sort of opinion on this, and, and then come back to you. If we we. Cooperation, competition, these are abstract concepts. And thinking about them in a concrete way, uh, it, it's a very interesting case study, I think, of looking back in the earlier, you know, in the, as the space race was underway between the US and the Soviet Union, there were national space programs in France, in West Germany, in the UK. Uh, in many cases, in some cases, those programs continued uh, in parallel with the European efforts. Um, if you look at satellite launch, I think Ariane can be described as a, a qualified success at, at the very least, if not, if not better. Uh, and yet the, uh, the human spaceflight side of things, there, have, you know, there is an ESA astronaut corps, but they've been launched either on space shuttles or, or on Sputniks. There's not an uh, independent manned capacity. Um, and what does that, I mean, there, there's something that is more difficult uh, you know, the obvious risk questions about, about human space flight. Uh, and I, I think, Tom, sort of in your years of interactions, I'm sure in many different ways, uh, with the ESA, what do the successes and shortcomings of ESA say about sort of deeper, co deeper cooperation in space between, between more globally going forward? Using ESA as kind of a case, as, as an example for other countries, how they might evolve. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think for ESA, um, Clearly, the astronaut corps is a force multiplier in, the, in that those flight opportunities, they'd like more. Um, but it's, you know, our relationship with, with ESA and actually other partners is around barter. It's not around exchange of funds, um, except we do buy seats from the Russians for our, for our uh, crew return. Um, so what does that barter look like in practice? It's, um, it's based on how much resource, it's kind of like, how much resources you put in is what you can, to the space station program, you get a commensurate uh, percentage of the utilization rights, including astronaut, in, in this case, ESA astronaut, or Japanese or Canadian flight opportunities out. So it's, it's really based upon how much you're putting into the program. Right. It gives you, gives you the uh, return. And those flight opportunities are important for ESA because the nations that get those, um, for example, I was in Belgium when um, they had their first Belgian astronaut go up, and it was all they talked about in Belgium for the time they were up there, at, at a time when Belgium can't even agree on the city dog catcher, let alone, <laughs> you know. So that was something that was of an immense unifying national pride level that, um, was much greater than any amount of money that went into that flight opportunity. So, so I think the human spaceflight side ties to that a bit. Um, you know, the ESA is very involved yeah, on, on, on Orion um, is building the service module. And, mm -hmm. and f for um, the way ESA is structured, 
it's, it's also a um, return based on how much money countries, individual countries put into ESA, they get a what they call just, just return of industry um, money coming out the back that they use then for their national industry. So um, critical for European industry and how they've maintained and built up um, a high tech, high paying jobs, high, high um, return mm -hmm. in, their, in their space industry um, which is the next phase for them now is really Absolutely. in cislunar space and beyond. Yeah, that's so, so, so who's doing what in Orion, Rob? So, the, so Orion, if you look at it as, is, uh, I hate Apollo on steroids, but, but if you go ahead and look at that, um, behind the capsule is the service module of Apollo 13 fame. Um, and we're, we, ours is also called the service module. Um, that's going to be, is being built by the European city, ESA. Um, uh, Airbus is a prime contractor, so for Lockheed, we, we interact, of course, with NASA and ESA, but then also directly with Airbus. Um, and I tell you, these, these, these folks know their stuff. Um, when we first look to break the vehicle, and, and for anybody that's a systems and en engineer in the room, you know, breaking a vehicle right down the middle, very complex interfaces, you know, we were like, oh my gosh, what, what, what's NASA thinking? <laughs> um, but then we started talking about it, and we looked at what they had for their ATV, which was their... Uh, Gosh, getting automated, transfer. automated transfer vehicle, which was their cargo uh, carrier to station. And we looked at the capabilities of that vehicle and we said, you know what, this could be a cheaper path from here to there as a joint, as humanity now, um, to, to utilize that. And, and so that really turned out to be a very wise approach. Um, they've been great to work with and they just signed in December um, at the, uh, at the, uh, Ministerial. Ministerial, thank you. Yeah. You're thinking congressional, that's not right. Yeah. At the ministerial, uh, the uh, next EM2, which would be the first crewed flight. Um, and, and what we found it is, might be EM1. It, it, which might also be EM1. Um, I can never remember if I'm talking the baseline or the, uh, the what if. So Tom's making reference to our, our first test flight around the moon, uncrewed in the current baseline is at the end of next year, full system test of Orion and SLS. Uh, and then after that, we were gonna start flying crew within a couple of years. Uh, annually, we've been asked by the administration, could we do that on this first flight? So uh, that's, where I, that's where I was this morning, was working on those studies. The, what we found is that the, the, um, all of the, the European countries we've worked with are extremely passionate about that next step, right? Get beyond LEO and get into exploration. So what can we do from a, um, a lunar perspective? What can we do from prospecting to asteroids? Other applications, you can use these Pathfinder flagships of, of NASA's, and, and the conversation has been, what can they add to the existing system? Don't reinvent the wheel. We don't need another capsule. We don't need another deep space vehicle. We have the one. Now we can go add on these, these other elements. So they're very interested in habitats, nodes, arms, of course, uh, et cetera. And just like real quick on your, kind of your question of extensibility of the ESA um, cooperation and what it might mean for other countries. We've been very sensitive of not everybody's at a level of resources of an ESA. Um, so that's why we have, you know, 780 agreements with 120 countries. Very small percent of those is around human spaceflight. A lot of those are around Earth applications, around um, uh, technology, discrete technology elements, uh, those kinds of things. Where the human spaceflight part enters in, though, because even India now um, has, a, has, is, has an aggressive human spaceflight program. Um, you heard UAEs thinking about where they go with, with their program. Um, I think the human spaceflight part adds a complexity and a challenge and a visibility that can be catalytic and again be a multiplier to those other areas that are important. So in India's case, when, when we first started dealing with them, it was all around satellite applications. They stuck their toe out. We started working with them out to the moon with a robotic mission to the moon. Um, and they, f they came back and said, boy, we've, we've turned on our people now. They really want to do more. Um, and it's a great way to give our STEM workforce, the young people who don't want to be just working in call centers or other places like that, don't find satellite applications enough to bring enough people into that pipeline that right. they want. So the, the human program helps kind of catalyze some of that. Right. So I want to ask you a question that, that might be uh, difficult to answer, but uh, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't ask it. Um, you're a sitting official in, in the US government at present, um, a government that has undergone some change in recent months. Um, all of this international cooperation, uh, 780 agreements with 120 countries, how has that 
changed uh, since January 20th with a, a president who has a very markedly different attitude towards collaboration than his predecessor? Um, short answer is it hasn't changed. You know, I think the longer term we'll see how it gets shaped because I think it's a, it's a reality of, who, of what we are as an agency that um, international engagement as well as national leadership in doing things that others don't do, right? you know. So you haven't felt any pressure from the White House no, we've to been, change they, what you've been doing? No, we've, we've been highlighting both, the opportunities for national leadership, for doing things that other countries can't do, that, or where they can come along and we can help them, uh, like outer planets and using things like SLS and Orion, or where, you know, where in Sicily or space we might want to be, uh, have a greater presence and a greater regular presence to be able to set the norms uh, as others move out there. And on the other side of that is how international engagement's a tool, too, that can be used um, maybe to offset how you might want to be engaging in a harder line in some areas right. or as a carrot in some areas. So it, and have your actions, international partners, have they been similar to, to what they were uh, several months ago? Have they changed? Um, they haven't changed yet. Uh, you heard, you know, the uh, what's going to happen with China or not. We have some very low-level things with China, Himalayan, looking at Himalayan water flows and, and you know things on the Earth data side. But um, so it's kind of going in. It's the same set of agreements and things. We haven't had any major new initiatives though. So we'll see how they want to handle that going forward. Um. I'll ask one more question and then, and then open it up to the room. Um, a lot of the, the earlier conversation we had here as well, as well as this conversation, comes down to a, a relationship between activities in space and their political effect on the ground. Of, you know, it's good, it's a channel for international cooperation. And uh, having grown up in the 1980s, I remember distinctly like my first sort of sense of international collaboration in space was that the Canadians built the robot arm for the space shuttle. <laughs> and I remember thinking as like an eight year old was like, can't we build robot arms in this country? Like, what do they have about like arm creation that we don't, right? Uh, and I mean, I think it was a very good robot arm and don't you know, think any less of uh, sort of the Canadian you know, colleagues who built it, but we probably could have built that in the US. And it was, a, it was a discreet thing of like, hey, Canada, make us a robot arm. Well, the systems engineers can figure out the interface. Um, and what I want to ask of all of you is, it, it seems to me that in, you know, I've never run a, uh, you know, a space flight program manned or otherwise, but in, in, in other things, when collaboration comes about because of an actual need intrinsic to the thing itself, uh, it tends to enhance productivity in a way that it doesn't when, you know, I got to pick the kid to play on my baseball team because, you know, he's the little brother of the guy who's good. Um, and which is not, I mean, no, no offense to the robot arm, people who I'm sure were fantastic. Um, Keep digging, but, you're doing right. But, <laughs> digging but, but what I want to ask you, because there, there's also, I mean, bloat can come out of cooperation. Endless committees, right. exactly. uh, endless let's revisit, let's come back. I'll write you a memo, you write me a memo. Mm -hmm. And if we're going to share costs, if we're going to share expertise, what can be done to do that in a way that we don't tie ourselves in knots? Um, and I want the most concrete answer you can give. About what? Concrete. concrete. Oh, is it complicated? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that might be the same thing. That might be the same thing because that's probably now the the. Um, so to to use your uh, your analogy, but I'm not jumping into the hole with you and keep digging. Um, <laughs> I got a robot arm to dig with. <laughs> if I want to, if I want to build the best team possible, um, I want to go get the next town over to bring their folks as well. Um, I, I could pick the best team I have from who grew up in my little hometown. But if I bring in the next town over, and then you select the top athletes from across, you get two things. First, they're diverse, right? They, they perhaps played um, on a different playing field, uh, dirt versus grass, or with cricket bats. I don't know. Um, that can be all the difference when you've got a problem to solve. Um, and that's what, you know, I think about diversity so, and, so and poor George with his. And I'm, I'm going to pose the same question to the rest, to, to the other panelists. What's the best example of cooperation in a space technology project you can think of and the worst? And I'll take just one or the other, but both would be good. Okay. Um, best one um, would be, I, I, I'll use an example of, of the ESM, I mean, if I'm allowed to, to um, the ESM dupe for the, room. the uh, European Service Module. They had something that was ready to go. 
Um, if we want to get to Mars, and we can be in Mars orbit in about a decade, uh, if we chose to, with humans, telerobotically exploring the surface, that's within our grasp, right? If you want to do it, you've got to stop reinventing stuff that's already existing that works good enough. And so I think it was... So what could the ESM do that, say, its American counterpart Oh, no, not? we could have done it. I mean, it, one person can build a spacecraft if you give them, like, a million years, right? They can figure right. it all out, and they can build right. the hardware. It's a hell of a lot better if you have two people, and if they're both really good, then it's even better, right? And I'm being a little bit flip, but the point being, of course we can do all this stuff in America. We no, got no, to the moon I'm on not slide rules. could we have, but what was sort of, like, shovel ready? It was with, done. It was done, right? I mean, why, why go design a service module with tanks and main engines and aux thrusters and RCS and yeah. solar so arrays what, and batteries, just, if you could it just was the there. Room through, what did it do? What do I, I, oh, oh, okay. You don't know what the ESM does. Oh, like, okay, what, I'm sorry. Yeah. Take what was unique. So, so it has solar panels to charge the batteries, has a good set of batteries, um, three fault tolerant, two fault tolerant engine systems fail down from a main engine to little aux thrusters and RCS jets, um, all the command and data handling, water because they have to drink, air because they insist upon breathing. Um, the astronauts. All of that was, was essentially there in one shape or another. Um, and so we were able to leverage that, we the human race now, were able to leverage that and just in, in not reinvent any of that. That to me is a, is a fantastic example. All right. And a horror story and then we'll go to Tom. What's the, what's the most, you know, you just kept circling around? And... Um, I would say, to be honest, I, I, I've never seen a case where it's been disastrous because you always come out better, quite honestly, if you have diverse thoughts. There, there's some challenges, there's cultural and language, and then if everybody would just stay on the English units of measurement, it would all be better. <laughs> oh, oh. Even England hasn't stayed on the English units of measurement. No, I, I would love to go to metric, but my... Um, we want to get to Mars, but, you know, gently. Not yes, exactly. <laughs> so, so those are the things you have to work through. So to be honest, any of the negative ones are just working through those interfaces and those personnel pieces. Very diplomatic answer. Tom. Um, so a couple of quick ones I saw. One, we, we had signed an agreement to fly to MIR um, prior to the, sh the uh, formal MIR program. We had three flights to MIR. And to do uh, the docking, um, we needed a, a docking module in order for it to even happen. And uh, we, within um, an envelope over a dinner, the Russians took that. We paid them since we didn't have the capability to turn that around quickly. They turned that around for $20 million within... That was in the envelope, or...? It was subsequent envelope, big envelope. <laughs> uh, but they turned that around within uh, under eight months uh, to a flight hardware that we flew and then docked to on, on um, STS-74. But anyway, so I, I think it focused, a real focus behind cooperation is important on the requirements. I think we stumbled around on space station for a long time because... Alpha, it, freedom, I mean, even the name was... All of that, and what, what really got it focused was bringing the Russians in and having a... Um, a it was actually going to fly. Um, so it got it off the um, kind of every country needing their own lab and needing their own and all the negotiations around how we were all going to you know, work together, it got very focused. So I think that's, that's the real challenge is how, for us now, is mm -hmm. sure, we can build anything in this country, and, and you're seeing more and more, we're, and you're going to see more and more, and probably can with we? this administration, you bet, mm -hmm. you, 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 you're going to see more with this administration, I think, of focus on U.S. industry and on our public-private partnerships. To answer a little bit more on your last mm -hmm. question, I think that will be the emphasis. International will still be there, but there will be this piece, right. too, stronger. But that's all great. We've got $19 billion, 18,000 civil servants, and nine centers that can do anything. So a big part of what we're trying to do is really streamline that to be really focused around what are the things that NASA can do, should be doing, and is probably the only one who can do it, or where we have a national interest, a long-term national interest in having that resident within a government, uh, government wheelhouse. Are you worried about the Earth observation mission that was discussed earlier, sort of? I missed of NASA. Oh, yeah. Um, just sort of, of whether NASA going forward will continue to have a strong focus on understanding the Earth and its climate. Well, we're in the middle, of, and I can't, you know, we're in the middle of the budget process stuff, so I'm not going to comment on right. that. But I, I think, you know, clearly what we do is more than climate change. I mean, we do. Um, 
we've got earth applications programs that span the globe that's, that, uh, that deeply impact how we deal with things on the ground in this country from right. you know, everything from coastal management of communities to disease vector tracting to uh, you know, how we interact um, with mom and pops on their farm or, you know, until we get more and more data from private systems. That's, NASA's data feeds a lot more than yep. just worrying about right. climate change. So, uh, Veronique, from your perspective, this is the same question of sort of international collaboration gone well and gone badly. Are, mm -hmm. there, are there any sort of stories that stand out to you? Not in space, because I'm not from the field, so I cannot, <laughs> unfortunately yeah. or fortunately. Um, of course, as a Luxembourger, we come from a totally different perspective, small country. We breathe collaboration as we go. We, we, we sit between Germany and France. We've gone through multiple phases of occupation, wars, etc. So we, or our fathers, grandfathers, grandmothers decided that um, we needed to be in every multilateral organization that was going to be there. So that was, that was, well, that's started. <laughs> started. Uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll have time for just a, a quick question or two if they're pressing. And let's take them, if there's uh, anyone else, also raise your hand and we can just take them, take them in a row. And uh, please go ahead and introduce Hi, yourself. Uh, I'm Nate and I work at the FAA Office of Commercial Space Transportation. Uh, my question's for Veronique. Um, I'm kind of curious, you were talking about the, uh, the resource utilization law and the partnerships that you're looking at forming uh, with like planetary resources and deep space industries and, and companies like that. Um, so when the US passed, passed our resource law uh, about a year, year and a half ago, you know, we got a lot of reaction, both good and bad, from the international community, um, you know, at the UN, for example, and in others. Um, while industry was quite supportive of that. I'm wondering, has Luxembourg um, gotten any kind of similar reactions or different reactions? And were there any lessons um, that you guys learned seeing what happened here in the US that you're applying now uh, to your law? Right, and we will peg this. Are there any other questions? All right, please go ahead. Thank you for the question. Um, well, we are only in the process of adopting the law, so um, I'm, I'm not aware of many major reactions to the good or the bad. Um, I think we got an, a number of encouragement from, from the commercial side um, um, and, on, and within ASA from our partners there. Um, I think our law is pretty similar to the US law uh, with the difference that you don't have to be a Luxembourg citizen because there are not so many around. Um, but we've been very careful about phrasing the law and making sure that nobody will think that Luxembourg is, is, is unhinging the Outer Space Treaty or anything. Um, we, we've partnered with the University of Luxembourg and a number of international space experts to make sure that we are on safe ground here and that we we're creating a, a legal framework that will be sound and, and give legal certainty to operators, but that we are not um, you know, overreaching or overstretching. We, we are uh, we're not the US, we're Luxembourg, and so we are very mindful of the, um, our size and, and the, the international context that we're revolving in. Um, we're hoping that um, well, this was going, is going to be a good, good starting point um, to to partner also with other countries who will venture <coughs> in the same direction and then see where we can take the international legal framework um, in you know, uh, decades down the road maybe because somebody said that these things are very slow. Um, but to th this is not something that we just want to do for ourselves and then have our law and that's it and the others can see where they, where they are. The, the, the idea is to, to have an international framework that works for everybody. And, and hopefully to kickstart it in a way from competition as well in the creation yes. of legal frameworks. Well, me, you were stuck with a little longer, but uh, the panelists <laughs> want to thank them very much uh, for taking the time. Eventually, they'll take all the chairs away, and I'll have to sit down. Yeah. But <laughs> thanks for uh, thank you both uh, for joining us. Um, it's a real pleasure uh, to have uh, both Deji and Carl uh, here, uh, here with us. Uh, they're both uh, extraordinarily accomplished and, uh, and beautiful writers. Um, uh, Carl has written, I believe, 11 novels? Yes. Um, yeah. Um, starting uh, in 2001 was the first one that you wrote on your own, and you had a, an earlier one as a collaboration uh, called Ventus, which uh, I have uh, only read part of and I've uh, really been enjoying so far. 
Uh, Deji, uh, your first book came out recently. Uh, it's the title that is very easy to remember because it's Nigerians in Space, which is a very catchy title. And uh, your next book, uh, After the Flare, uh, is coming out in September. So everybody should uh, keep an eye out for it. Uh, and uh, I think we're going to sort of frame this conversation as a little bit of you know, what can science fiction do, do for us instrumentally, not that anybody sets out uh, to sort of write or read fiction in a sort of overly instrumental fashion in order as a rule. Um, and uh, you know, we talked about this a little bit over email. And I'm just curious, maybe which, whichever you, one of you cares to start. Um, OK. Um, well, it's easy to, as a science fiction writer, to go down the route of, you know, rah, rah, we're great, and you know, Star Wars man. Um, <laughs> but to get a little serious and pedantic for a minute, why use fiction um, to try and inspire um, what are essentially massive economic investments here? Um, it, it, it would seem to be an odd fit. Um, but uh, uh, for instance, Professor Brian Boyd of Auckland University is, uh, wrote a book called uh, On the Origin of Stories. Uh, and what he's found is that, um, the way he puts it, um, narrative is the default mode of understanding of the human mind. In other words, if we can understand something in narrative terms, we automatically will. And this means that um, storytelling is so deeply set in us that it is what we go to automatically when we hear about or learn about anything. So, when it comes to space development, for instance, um, which is a highly complex and in, in some ways extremely abstract thing, um, to frame it, to understand it, we, we will do so in terms of stories. The only question is what those stories are and who, if anyone, controls the narrative. The power of narrative. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Um, just in the previous panel, it was interesting hearing about um, you know, SpaceX and Virgin Galactic and how they've captured the public imagination versus uh, Lockheed, which has been doing great work for four decades. And one of the reasons, I think, is the narrative. I was thinking messaging. Um, you know, in in my, my day job, I work uh, for a nonprofit. We, messaging is huge for campaigning and getting people to care. And just thinking from that perspective that the story of these sort of titans of industry wanting to explore space is very interesting. They, they're good at flashy, making things look flashy in gadgets. Um, so, so part of it, you know, in terms of that uh, particular aspect of, of, of traveling to space, I think it's about using narratives to inspire people. You know, for, for my own writing, um, basically, uh, I, I grew up, um, my father's a scientist. I grew up with scientists, uh, Nigerian scientists, coming over to the house. It was a very normal thing. I never felt like science was something that was beyond me, that something technical was something that I couldn't achieve just by sitting around and hearing those conversations. I was very fortunate to have that. And uh, you know, writing about the Nigerian space program, I wrote about it before there was a lot of information coming out from Nigeria that there actually was a space program. Uh, but I bit mostly thought of it as, you know, I grew up in the US. Uh, I remember the Challenger exploding. I remember all these important moments in, in space history. I remember wanting to be an astronaut and feeling that that was something that was possible, but uh, a frustration that uh, here there were people like my father and uh, other scientists and co of color and women scientists, and you just didn't see them on the big screen. You didn't see them in writing. Uh, so the story came out of that, um, but you know, making it interesting. Uh, one of the things about uh, fiction, which is, is, is creating tension, creating conflict. Um, so uh, just trying to put that in a story and, and, and give people a place to go, it's a challenge because uh, you want to be optimistic and you want to show people a grand vision, but it can get boring if um, nothing uh, happens, nothing explodes, nothing goes wrong. So it's, it's one of, something that science fiction writers struggle with. I mean, Mars in particular, I think, has sort of like loomed large in, in, in the human imagination. Um, particularly in, in the sort of genesis of, of science fiction and you know, War of the Worlds and you know, the canals, I mean, which was not, you know, it was a, discovery, a factual discovery, but one that sort of met, 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 metastasized into fiction. Um, I'm curious how both of you sort of have thought about the large body of science fiction about Mars, which I, I don't doubt that you both know far better than I do. 
Uh, so I'm curious, you know, if there's anything particularly Martian related that you particularly like or, or think is sort of, has sort of, was before its time in, in a way that was sort of like had some meaning to you? Oh. Um, want to go ahead? Well, yeah, sure. I think, I think for me, there is a huge body of, of work on it. And actually, that's why in my new book, I skipped Mars <laughs> and had them go somewhere else uh, because I thought that it had been explored so well. But actually, Ray Bradbury's stories, he had a Martian Chronicles. I remember feeling that uh, he just explored the human condition um, and what would be lacking um, being transplanted to Mars in these really poignant, very sad, and somewhat frustrating stories. Um, that wasn't as much about the technical aspects of flying to Mars, but I really feel um, that that, and that was a book my brother handed me, uh, just being inspired by that, that this is the kind of storytelling I could get into, where not everything is, is great and wonderful and, and written for kids. There's uh, adult things happening, too. Yeah, the irony for me is that I've spent the last year or year and a half daydreaming about how to colonize Venus. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm old enough to remember it, uh, in school looking at um, uh, school textbooks ab uh, about the planets that had images of the Martian canals in them, because that's what we knew. And I remember the, you know, the excitement at looking at that first grainy image of Mars taken from orbit that showed craters and going, wait a minute, craters? That looks like the moon. That doesn't look like Mars. So for me, the, the, it hasn't really been um, fiction, but nonfiction, the process of the unveiling of Mars over the decades that has been most extraordinary, that, that it has gone in my lifetime and in my memory from being a, um, an Edwardian fantasy image um, to being a, um, a lunar wasteland to being something enigmatic and now potentially alive uh, that's taking on its, its, its own sort of, or asserting, I, I guess, its own um, style and substance to us. Uh, it's going from being something we imagine to something that is speaking to us. And that's an amazing journey to undertake. So this idea of the power of narrative both to inspire and as a sort of like lens of understanding uh, is certainly true of fiction broadly and, and not uh, particular to science fiction. And we were talking earlier that you know, trying to sort of police the boundaries of what is and isn't science fiction is not a terribly productive exercise. Um, <laughs> There has been, uh, and maybe you can, I think the audience is probably broadly familiar, you can walk us through a little bit, a sort of like distinct movement within the sort of hard, hard science fiction uh, to sort of identify scientific rigor as a, a sort of like intrinsic element to the construction of a novel um, in a way that wasn't always present, right? It was, this was a, a sort of ideological commitment on the part of a set of authors some of the time. Uh, and I'm curious, uh, whether you see that as uh, something that, you know, in, in the form of constraints are put upon literature as a, a form, uh, whether this is a sonnet or a villanelle or a short story or a novel, that this is a sort of formal constraint uh, that it just makes it interesting in the way that formal constraints do, or does it actually result in something distinct uh, in terms of, you know, the, the way in which uh, hard science fiction can be read uh, for something beyond you know, pleasure uh, and sort of like in imagining uh, what we might do out in the world? Well, I have a lot to say about that. Um, for, for me, yes, it's a, it's a formal constraint, like, like doing a sonnet. For when I write hard science fiction, it's simply to give myself a set of parameters to work in that can allow free play. Um, but there are a lot of people out there who um, uh, assert for ideological reasons um, uh, an approach to communicating or approach to thinking about the world um, that, that says you must write about you know, what is scientifically possible. It's not actually a large group of people within the science fiction community. Um, but uh, what I've discovered over the years is that uh, however hard you may try at uh, being faithful to reality in, in such a way, 
you're, you're only really going to expose the massive blind spots that you, uh, you have about other things when you do it. So to take for instance, I mean, science fiction has been very, very good at talking about nanotechnology, anticipating biotech and uh, space development. And uh, we can imagine all these things. And yet, for its entire history, science fiction has consistently failed to imagine that humanity might um, improve the way that we govern ourselves. Well, I mean, the foundation, right? Isaac Asimov, isn't that like okay. part of the canon? Was you bring that up because yeah. it's essentially the only one. It's um, a big one, though. It is, <laughs> but, but I think the Star point- Star Trek also. Yeah, yeah and but, Star Trek. Yeah. Uh, but the point stands yeah. that I, I think that um, uh, there are these blind spots. Yeah. Um, and uh, a, a focus on hard or rigorous science, that's the core of science fiction, um, is one of the things that can tr contribute to those blind spots. I mean, I agree with the basic premise that we are often imagining apocalypses and wars and, um, but you know, having I'm in the process of completing this book, um, and feel like there's been with the popularization of Star Talk, and um, I feel like uh, movies like Gravity, um, and um, you know, Kim Stanley Robinson series, um, that uh, the bar has been raised for um, technical science fiction. I think a lot of the genres are actually for marketing. Um, they help uh, customers. They help companies sell the books, and they help customers find the books, find what they want. I don't think hard science fiction is for everyone. I know a lot of people who don't like it. Um, what I've found is that one of the challenges of writing about these space programs and um, space exploration is that the real narratives that are happening are actually so extraordinary, and the amazing advances that are happening on a daily basis, the discoveries that are happening, are be they're stranger than fiction. So trying to boil that down into something and still tell a story can be a challenge. Um, I, you know, I, 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 I've come from a more of a literary, uh, just the, my writing degree is more of a literary MFA, so um, I, I've maybe trained a little bit more to focus on uh, character and stories, but I don't, I don't actually think one is better than the other. I think, uh, you know, as long as people are entertained and find it interesting, it, in, it can inspire people, then that's good enough. I've been shortchanging the audience systematically, which I feel bad about, but these conversations are hard to interrupt. But I do want to open it up um, if there are questions in the audience. Uh, please raise your hand. Yeah, go ahead. Um, and yeah, we'll. Um, yeah, um, thank you for sharing your thoughts about this, uh, about hard science fiction also. it's. Uh, uh, don't you don't you think that sometimes uh, this this formal representation of science, as you said, this this universe and the fact that you know astronauts live in microgravity and and sometimes you, you know I, I I've read some of it and sometimes I have the feeling that the author has to spend more time educating the reader actually than than telling a story and mm -hmm. you know I I wanted to know what you think about um, maybe authors like Stephen Baxter or The Martian that came out recently, the, those were you know, examples where you, you were educated and entertained at the same time? Yeah, the danger is always that you write a, a, a textbook with characters. <laughs> uh, and uh, the thing is that that, that used to be a, a normal approach for science fiction uh, to the point where there are classic tropes that you learn uh, when you're starting out, such as the Rod and Don conversation, where two sock puppets tell each other things that they already know. And so, Rod, we're on Mars. And as you know, the red planet, as it used to be called, <laughs> it, it just goes on and on. And it, you, you could have hundreds of pages of that kind of narrative back in the 1950s. Um, but it, it is true that the, uh, uh, the standards have, have risen uh, to such a degree that uh, uh, that sort of didactic writing is, is much rarer these days. And, and it's a good thing. Yeah, I, I would say uh, in, in response to that about the sort of backstory, it's an art form um, that um, the best writers do it so easily. You you just read your eye just goes right over the page. You follow the story. You're you're inspired. You don't even realize they've just fed you three facts about an obscure plant or something. Um, 
But I think it's not just science fiction. Tom Clancy was kind of, I mean, he's a bestseller, big time, really good at weaving technical information in with a very pacey narrative, you know, very aggressive writing. Um, you know, that's why those books sell. So I think it's just an art form that uh, writers have to learn. Let's pass our model MK83 microphone, Tom Clancy style. <laughs> Hi, uh, Kevin Cole. Just as a, as a follow-up to, to the question and answer here, have you thought of, or do you know uh, science fiction writers who are writing textbooks with characters as part of STEM education. I mean, kind of flipping it around and saying, hey, you know, these textbooks are kind of dull and boring. Can you make the textbooks more exciting by, you know, adding in? Well, uh, not specifically for the educational system, but personally since 2005, I've uh, been working on a hybrid form of uh, fiction that I call scenario fictions for uh, mostly foresight clients in the military and government. Uh, I've done two short novels for the Canadian government um, on the future of uh, various military um, uh, matters, uh, and just completed one for the US Air Force. Um, these take a stack of findings, which might be you know, uh, this thick and, and and these are publicly available? Uh, publicly available, generally, uh, though not always. I've written and they things. They say government support for the arts is, you know. <laughs> I, I've, written, I've written a few things that will never be read in, in public. Uh, but um, uh, you take a thick stack of, uh, of documents that no one will typically read. How do you communicate these, uh, particularly if they are public doc documents? Um, well, you render them into narrative. If narrative is the default mode of human understanding, then they're already in the worst possible form in that stack. So um, uh, this has uh, been a highly successful strategy for me, both professionally um, and uh, 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 to learn uh, sort of the, the next stage of the craft. So uh, to, to answer your question, yes, it can be done. Um, and it, it can be done quite successfully. But I don't think it could have been done using the attitude towards these uh, ideas that people had back in, say, the 1950s, when we, we thought there's science, there's fiction, let's just mash them together, right? Um, I, I think a great deal more sophistication is required, but that sophistication is out there in the current uh, uh, generation of writers. Yeah, all the way in the back, and we can move, work our way forward. Uh, there's even further back than you, sir. Yeah. Uh, but you're, you're next. <laughs> Yes, it's a wonderful talk. Thanks very much. I, uh, I'm old enough to have been uh, inculcated in the three kings of science fiction, the Dreikonig, Asimov, Bradbury, and uh, Heinlein. And I wonder, um, and they still remain deep in my heart, deep in my psyche. So I wonder, for you as authors, do you have... Uh, favorites that you think uh, are up and coming? In other words, a new generation of writers. New generation of... Uh... Yeah, I mean, I, I can speak to... Um... <laughs> there's one right here. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's, there's so many. Um, there's a, I, I think the collections are really good. Um, there was one called um, Long Hidden, uh, which is basically marginalized voices, women, minorities, LGBT writers, talking, writing speculative fiction, and some of the best stories I've read uh, were in that volume. It was a Kickstarter volume. There's another one coming out. Um, so, you know, I think there are just, they're just a lot of, of voices. Um, you can, I mean, if you look at the, the Hugo Award winners, there have been a lot of both translators and, and exciting writers coming up. Um, so I think things look really good and promising. Um, I think. One thing that I've been waiting for, and I think we're going to start seeing these voices, is the Harry Potter fan fiction community. So the people who loved Harry Potter and would write fan fiction, and these are, these are millions of people, young people, uh, all, all different, you know, all different uh, demographics, wrote intensively, got feedback, they got workshopped within these online forums, and those people are going to start, we're going to start seeing those stories come onto the market. You know, where did their imagination, if they're writing novels at age 12, where are those stories going to be in 10 years? I think we're going to have some really, like an explosion of creativity. 
Yeah, I, I don't think we have or will have again a, uh, a, a small set of universally known names. But, uh, you know, the current generation includes people like Kim Stanley Robinson um, and uh, uh, new authors, particularly many new, um, uh, really excellent female authors uh, like Ada Palmer, for instance, um, who are, you know, writing fantastic um, cutting edge fiction. So I think it, it, in some ways the golden age for science fiction is right now, but it's, uh, there's so much noise and clutter in our, our mental lives these days that it's, uh, it's just hard to know or hear about these people. Uh, a little investigation, particularly, uh, yes, in the anthologies, it, it will turn up some people that could become uh, lifelong favorites. Yeah, and I'll just, I'll just speak to it. One other thing, uh, trend that we're seeing is the, you know, Netflix, HBO, um, Amazon, these services are opening up possibilities for science fiction authors, but they're, bec they're going into the writer's room. Um, so I think a lot of talent, you could see like Charles Yu on uh, Westworld, um, he wrote a book called How to Live Safely in a Science Fictional Universe, it's a really great book, I recommend it. Um, and, you know, as a, a lead writer for Westworld on HBO. So I think uh, it's not everything's gonna come out in, in book form. Yeah, hi, uh, Tad Daly's my name. I, um, I was intrigued by what Carl Schroeder had to say about governance and, and imagining better forms of uh, the human race uh, running its affairs. So I would like to ima ask us to imagine the moment, this topic is imagination, when the first human sets foot on Mars and what flag they're going to plant. Um, let, let me just give two quick factoids on this. I, uh, I've, I've been interested in this issue for a while. I went to the NASA library, talked to the uh, terrific librarians over there, and they did some digging into the archives, and we discovered that they talked about this in the mid-1960s. There were some voices inside NASA who said they ought to plant the United Nations flag or maybe some kind of artistic rendering of the Earth from space, but those voices uh, were overruled. Second factoid is Neil Armstrong, was interviewed on July 20th, 1979. The question was, how did you feel as you stood there saluting the American flag, Mr. Armstrong, Dr. Armstrong? And he said, I suppose you're thinking about pride and patriotism, but we didn't feel very nationalistic at that moment. We felt it was a venture on behalf of all of humankind. Mm -hmm. And so I just wanna propose that it's one thing to imagine uh, somebody setting foot on Mars and planting the flag of the United States. It's entirely another, and for me at least, a lot more exhilarating to imagine the first human planting some kind of flag on behalf of all of humanity. And I suspect Tad Daly and Neil Armstrong aren't the only ones. Yeah, I, I, I've taken to the Armada theory of Martian colonization. First of all, we send robots, they built the cities, um, and then we show up en masse so that the very first ship that lands lowers this giant ramp and a thousand people simultaneously put their <laughs> footprints on the planet. Um, it would be a very, you know, different, different way of going. I, love, I, I just love that. I'm, you know, I'm putting on my campaigner hat. I'm like, that is a good campaign. <laughs> the same way that Antarctica, you know, there's good, you know, Antarctica is kind of, you know, in this international, um, for the scientific community, it, uh, I think that's a really, really nice campaign. There's one of the Oscar-nominated short, shorts uh, for, for this year was um, an animated film, and it showed uh, about to set foot. I think it was, we couldn't tell what planet it was, but some U.S. astronauts about to set foot, and then they see some aliens have already put their flag down. <laughs> There's this whole silly conflict, and then it turns out that uh, the aliens were just playing golf, and it was just a golf hole that they had. <laughs> <laughs> One of my favorite space age artifacts is, uh, you know, if you're a government employee and you travel, there's a form you have to fill out, and there's the form that Neil Armstrong filled out, like when he got back from the moon, of like <laughs> Apollo and the, air, the aircraft carrier and this and that. So there's always like a quotidian anchoring to that sort of like sentiment. Um, yes. My name is Shalina. Hi. Um, I thought that what you had to say about branding of with private space companies was really interesting. And when you see a lot of the videos, publicity videos from companies like SpaceX and Virgin Galactic, it almost seems like they are science fiction as you're watching them. 
And so I was wondering now, as these private companies seem to be using a lot more narratives in order to get people excited about spaceflight, does it seem like the public increasingly doesn't really know the difference between what is science fiction and what is actually something that can really happen in space? A willful blurring of the boundaries uh, in an attempt. Well, I don't really know what the difference is, so. Um. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a great point and a great question. I, I like it a lot. I think for me, um, actually one of the most inspiring videos was none of, none of those videos. Maybe a year, 18 months ago, there was a craft, an aircraft, an unmanned aircraft from Boeing that uh, had been in space for a year and landed and it looked sort of like a shuttle. I'm sure I'm, people in the room probably know what that was. Actually, that video, I watched that video so many times, it absolutely blew my mind. And I couldn't believe that I was saying, hey, have you seen this video, have you seen? Because that to me was, um, first of all, the ship was so interesting to look at. It had worked, it been, had been in space. And I didn't understand why the people weren't making a bigger deal out of it. It, it made a, it, I mean, it got on the nightly news, but. Yeah, I was gonna, that's. But, but the video was available, you could see it landing. Yeah. So right. for, for me, but that was. But you couldn't know yeah. what the thing did. You, right? you didn't know what it was, but that's a, an interesting mystery. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For, and a final yeah. question. Yeah. yeah it, it seems like one of the problems with space is that uh, it's very unforgiving, so if you're, having a nice ocean story and the boat develops a leak and there's a shark and it takes a long time. Whereas in space, the single most likely thing to happen is bang, there's a hole and you're dead. Yeah. <laughs> so so as, a, as authors, what do you do about that? How do you, I mean? You don't kill your characters that way. <laughs> <laughs> the, the other thought I had was with, with regard to going to Mars, what if, what if a week out into your 10 month trip or eight month trip, you discover you're sure that there seems to be some sort of very slow leak, <laughs> and, you can, and you realize that you're not going to make it. But you'll probably make it seven months, but you won't make it all ah, the way. What well, do you do then? That is the, a, a fundamental premise of uh, Kim Stanley Robinson's recent novel, Aurora, um, uh, in which uh, an interstellar um, uh, generation ship has this exact problem. Um, so yes, there's a great deal to be said about it, but uh, you have to be willing to go to some pretty daunting psychological and emotional places um, as a writer to, to talk about it. Yeah, the space debris problem was, I, I have a scene in the, in the forthcoming book, yeah, and it's all kind of internal, the fears of, of you know, knowing that all these objects could be hurtling at you at any moment. Uh, but, I want to do yeah. my best impression of a speck of dust traveling <laughs> yeah. 50,000 miles an hour and bring this conversation yeah. to an abrupt halt. <laughs> um, thank the panelists. Uh, very much. Um, and uh, thank, thank you all very much for coming, as well as Andres, Emily, Kirsten, Tori, and, and the Future Tense team for, for organizing this event. Thanks.